Oh, you can't control it. Be fair. How about? Yeah. Let's see. Uh, okay. Here comes right. the door, what channels? So, what's the topic? So, the topic is. Yeah. The error in the Quran with regards to embryology. All right, so I agree to talk. About, I agree right. that he could talk about the Bible. So, no, I don't have a problem with starting with the Quran. Yeah. So long as once again you say it's fine, we can talk about the Bible as well. And that yes, way. Yes, absolutely. All right. That's so let. Fine. So what? Can I just let's lay some gra groundwork? I'll tell you what our position is in regards to Quran and science first. Yeah. And then you understand it, and then you can contribute to what your position is. With well, as it relates to the Bible and science, yeah, and then we can start talking about individual examples, including embryology. That way, both of our audiences will know, you know, where we stand on the issues. Yeah, how does that sound? That sounds fine. All right. So what I wanted to say first and foremost is that we, and I think maybe you'll agree with me here, we don't say that science is incorrigible, or that it produces eternal sets of truth, and we know that the scientific method is based on falsification as Karl Popper and others have stipulated. And as such, there can be change in science, even that which is referred to as scientific fact. We know that Thomas Kuhn wrote a, a book called The Structures of Scientific Revolution, yep. which talks about what he refers to as paradigm shift. Yeah, I've got it. You've got that book? I've got that book. So me and you, I think, both agree that we shouldn't be using science as a yardstick for truth in an absolute sense, because maybe me and you will agree that science is itself not a perfect or eternal, incorrigible enterprise. Would you agree with that? Can I reply? Yes, of course. So, I agree with the general thesis laid out by Mohammed. I agree with it. However, there are relative truths within greater paradigms that we can establish as certain. Things that we have no reason to indicate because until there is a greater degree of observational tool, as well as the fact that technology itself will reach a limit in terms of what observations it can make, will mean that there is a conclusivity to certain observations. Certain observations are not all, they're not all like speculative physics, like the multiverse and discussions about the Big Bang and you know, questions about what gravity is. Yeah. Some things are actually indisputable uh, descriptions of the material world, such as the chemical compound of water, H2O. All right, so I, in a sense, I kind of do agree with you, but I'd like to kind of couch my language in more specific and sophisticated terminology. Go on. I think you're right to say that there is different epistemic weights to different observations that yep. one can have scientifically. Yeah. But I would I would use it on a scale of probability. So Which for, is exactly what science does. Yeah, exactly. So for instance, like if I say that men have XY chromosomes and women have XX chromosomes, that to me seems a more certain fact than string theory, for instance, because string theory was is new. It hasn't had the same the same kind of um, kind of peer-reviewed exposure as has you know the biological understanding of XY versus XX. Yeah. I think I think me and you have got enough grasp of yes. the scientific method yeah. to, to now move the conversation forward. So yeah, so so that's good. So what we're saying is effectively, we agree on the fact that science is not an eternal truth, but that certain things are probabilistically more possible than others. Yes, and that some observations we have no grounds to dispute. Would you agree with that? There are certain observations within science. Yeah, I would agree with that. Right, and and the, the so for instance, like the X Y and X X. Well, I, I mean, it, it's a bit more complicated than that because there's X X Y and there's X Y Y. Right, right. Y, no, 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 but yeah, yeah. yeah, that, yeah these yeah, are additions yeah. rather than replacements for Mark. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, okay. the, so they work within a, a certain paradigm. Right. So now, here, here's let me let me lay out my case. Yeah. Because I'm the prosecutor in this discussion. No, we are both prosecutors You're, and we're both defendants. Right, right, well, so, so let, we, me, let me, let me, let me well, lay out We, 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 we talked about a fact that yeah, 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 yeah. we're going to bring both of the books. Yes, that's absolutely fine. Yeah. That's absolutely okay. fine. So in terms of the standard, so I'm going to lay out my case. In terms of the standard that the Quran lays out for itself, 
It says in Surah 482, you probably know it off the top of your head. Yes. What does it say? It's going to say it. If it was mother and God, they would have found in it many inconsistencies. Yeah, many. exactly. Many. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just I'll just read it um, in the translation that we've got here as well. Yes. So just to make sure that there's no dispute for eighty-two. Do they do they not consider the Quran carefully? Yes. Had it been from other than Allah, they would surely have found therein many a contradiction. Now, many a contradiction can be internal contradictions or it can be external contradictions. Agreed? Yes. So, Muslims have marshaled, and I accuse the, the, the Dawah, those who are doing Dawah, I accuse them of lying deliberately because they claim, and I'm going to demonstrate that it's false, that the Quran... Wait, when you say they, let's be clear here. The Dayi, the, the ones no, no, doing Dawah. Let, let's, be, let's be very specific. Because what, what, people like Zakir Naik, people okay, like... People like Adnan Rashid, people right. like. So, so you're so I've, about given, I've given you some examples. Shabi no, Ali. But are you talking about Zakir Naik? Or are you talking because you have to understand something? I, I think it's very important to realize that we don't all have the same view when it comes to this. I agree. So, I agree. so, so it's not. I don't think it's very clever to generalize. The well, dai I, 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 I tried to be specific. I did say the Dai, those doing Dawah. Some. And I gave examples well, of the right, kind yeah, of people that I'm talking that's about. That's why I just had to interrupt to make sure that that kind of specificity was ensured. Okay, so, so we've, we've clarified that. So now, in terms of the, the, the argument... You like that, eh? Yeah, in terms of the argument... <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's, it's to, totally fine. He said it's totally fine. In, in, terms of, in terms of the argument... We didn't disagree. In terms of the argument... Yes, sir. Muslims make the argument that the Quran accurately describes embryology. That, that's what they say. Yeah. Now, I'm talking, I, I've qualified that. So when I say Muslims, I'm speaking about certain kinds of Muslims like Adnan Rashid, like Zakia Naik, right, right. like Shabia Ali. Not right. every Muslim. I, I fully appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. So it is fair, therefore, for me to test that argument. Of course. Right. So when I look at the description in the Quran, yeah. and I'm going to read it to you, I'm going to ask you to, to just, just qualify for me what you think the stages are that are being described. So if we go to Surah 23, 12. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So 12 to 14, if you want to recite that while I'm getting out of English. No, it's fine. You can just go ahead. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, but, but, but just before I do recite it, if you want me to, there are, there are two space. There are. It's not just 23, which talks about stages. There's 22 yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've got Surah that. Surah Al-Hajj. I've got that. Yeah, so what, do you want me to go through all the stages? No, 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 I'm going to read it. And when you hear a stage, I want you to stop me, interrupt me, and say this is a stage. Is that fair? Okay. So, so that everyone can hear the case being made out. Right. right? So, and indeed we created man out of an extract of clay. Thereafter we made him as a nufta. Nutfa. Nutfa, thank you. Uh, in a safe lodging. Then we made the nufta nutfa. In, nutfa into a cloth. Then into we a, made the, into, a, sorry? into a clot. clot. Then we made the clot into a little lump of flesh. Yeah. Then we made out of that little lump of flesh bones. Then we clothed the bones with flesh, yeah. and then we brought it forth as another creation. Yeah. So how many stages did you hear there? In this part, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقَنَا الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ سُلَالَةٍ مِنْ تِينَ. So uh, uh, number one, team. What, so, what, sorry? So the clay or mud. So clay, yep. All right. And then you have um, We made them into a nutfa in a safe lodging. So nutfa. Nutfa. It's the same lodging. It's the safe lodging. So we created the nutfa on a safe lodging. We created the nutfa on a safe فخلقنا مضغة عظاما فكسونا العظام ولحمة ثم أنشأناه خلقا آخر فتبارك الله أحسن الخالقين. So you hear three stages. No no so um, so no 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 you got you got you got so let's go with نطفة. Yeah. We could, yeah we talk about embryology in particular yeah. right. So if you have نطفة. Yeah. Which then is? you have مضغة. Which is? مضغة is a, a lump. Yep. And in, by the way, on this... No, 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 just, no, no we're I, just going I, through the no, stages. But I have to, no, I'm doing it, but yep. you have to let me say what, okay. what it is, yeah? In chapter 22, it says about mudra. Yep. So it's partly formed and partly unformed. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And then, so after mudra, you have alaqa, which is a claw. And then after alaqa, you have aidam, which is bones. Yep. Yeah. And then you have after that uh, flesh. Okay. So right. five. Now, again, 
just like the Muslim brother before him, without any prompting from me, no prompting from me at all. Muhammad said, you have bones, then flesh. Yeah. So that's two Muslims yeah. independently, and Hijab's an experienced debater who said bones and then flesh. That's right. Now, guys, it is a simple fact of embryology, and you can all go and Google it right now. Bones do not... Okay. Now, notice the interruptions. Notice the interruptions. Guys, let him make his claim, please. Let him make his claim. There we go. Bye, Mansour. Bye, Mansour. Bye, Mansour. Mansour, do you not think that Hijab's big enough to stick up for himself? Mate? Yeah, we don't yeah, need I, help. I don't think Hijab needs your help. <laughs> but if you want to come into the debate, stand there. No, no, can't. Just yeah, stand here. Can you continue? Why are you off? I'm going to correct it every now and then. Right. So, guys, I challenge you now to go away and research it yourself. No embryologist argues that bones become flesh. Not okay. anyone that is respectable. Okay. Except Mansour. Really? Except Mansour. Except Mansour. <laughs> so, 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 sadly, this is why I have to raise my voice. I didn't want to, but I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to raise my voice because of Mansour. It's a shame because me and Hijab were having a nice conversation. Until? until Mansour turned up. <laughs> so, so, I'm not, I'm not, all you're doing is delaying the argument. I'm still going to say my point, Mansour. Well, I'm waiting, hurry. I'm waiting for him to show. I'm waiting for him Bob, to show. Made your point. I haven't finished my point. I haven't made my point. All right, guys, be quiet, please. Let him finish his point because okay. we have nothing to hide here. Yeah. We have nothing to hide here. Let him finish his point. He said there's no references. Yeah. We're gonna, we're gonna so, just explore that. So the fact of the matter is, without any prompting from me, Hijab has said, bones then flesh. Yes, yes. And it is a fact, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, a fact that you can check for yourselves that bones and flesh grow together. Okay. JC, focus. No, they don't. Okay, know, they grow together. They grow at the same time. Guys, guys, calm down. They grow at the same time guys, calm down. from the mesoderm. Guys, calm down. Yes, yes. So please. when the Quran yeah. says that bones grow with flesh, it's wrong for two reasons. Yes, sir, go ahead. Firstly, yeah, yeah. there is no ossification at this point. It's cartilage. It's not bone. That's false. Man. Ossification comes that's, later. That's actually false. Comes later. And yeah, it yeah. isn't that the bones grow independently from the flesh. No, by the way, that's... They grow together. Okay, uh, Why are you interrupting? Okay. They grow together. And this is why the Quran is wrong, because right. it stages it. And he admitted it. Fine. Bones then flesh. Your response. Okay. He said there's no ossification. O ossification is when bone forms. And this is also referred to as osteogenesis. Okay. He also said bones then flesh. Now, let's be very clear. The word bones in Arabic is aidam. Now, the, the word in the ayah was aidam. The word aidam in the Arabic language includes cartilage, by the way. How do we know that? If you look at the, the Arabic lexicons, and I can give you the names of them if you like. I'd like you to pull it up. Yeah, it's Lisan al-Ara from Ibn Manzur. Yeah, no, can you pull it up? Can we see it? Yeah, yeah, I can. Yeah, let's pull it up. Uh, so, for example, I'll tell you, I'll read it exactly as it says in the lexicon, right? Yeah. So, basically, this is what uh, Ibn Manzur says in his lexicon. Well, so, so Al Fayruz Abadi mentions. Al Fayruz Abadi is another Arabic lexicon. Okay. Al Khudruf, and this is, he's, he died 817 Hijri. Yeah. Al Khudruf, Wal Khudruf, Kullu Avmin. Guys, please, I'm, I'm quoting it. I'm quoting it. I'm quoting it by the word. So there's no one here going to say, get me a reference. I'm quoting it. He says, Al Khudruf, Al Khudruf, Kullu Avmin. Rahsin yukalu huwa marin al unfi wa nugadu al katfi wa ruus al al asna. Yeah, and this is in. Well, I'll tell you exactly where it is. It is in Fayruz Abadi's Qamus al Muhit, uh, Volume One, Page Eight Hundred and Forty. Any any issues? So the, yes, I have an issue. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, no, no. Wait, wait, let, let me finish. Let me, let me, yeah, I'll let you finish. So, but I have an issue. Now, yes. now that we have established, have we not? You, with references, have we not? Yeah. That al-ghudruf, which are, is cartilage, is bone and cartilage can be used synonymously. He said that ossification doesn't happen. That's absolutely absurd. 
No, I didn't no, say that. No, he did say at this point. He did say that. He didn't say that. He said no. He didn't say that. No, no, no. No, no, no. no he's making scientific mistakes. He said there's no reference as well. Okay. All right. So excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. He said, yeah, guy, guy, calm down because he's saying that there's no reference. I've got a book called The Fundamentals of Human Embryology. Be quiet, please. Uh, the Fundamentals of Human Embryology. Printed web, please. Uh, yeah, can okay, I tell you, page 148, this is a book that is used the, uh, by biologists in, in their first or second year. And this is also a book that is used by medical students Where? and others. It's, it's a book called The Fundamentals of Human uh, Embryology. Okay. We'll, we'll look at it, it we'll might be Oxford yeah. University yeah. Press. I'm okay. not going to give you like a full bibliography. Okay, now you're so being a bit good. ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Now, page 148. I'll give you that one. I'll give you that one. All right, look, page 148. Listen to what it said. Soon after the cartilaginous models of the bones have been established, the myogenic cells, which have now become myoblasts, aggregate to form muscle masses on the ventral and dorsal aspects of the limbs. These muscle masses in the relevant compartments form the flexors and extensors of the joints. Rotator muscles are also formed so that flexors and protonators and pronotators are related and extenders are uh, uh, and supernators are related. Now this is very, very clear to me, and it's actually a reference. Can I, can I no, let me, no, uh, let wait, me just wait, finish. Okay. No, 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 please. Yeah. When somebody who is a layman when it comes to science, <laughs> and is a layman when it comes to philosophy, and is a layman when it comes to Islamic theology, and is a layman when it comes to the Arabic language, yes. has the audacity to come no, and stand. No, wait, excuse no, me. No, no, right. Right. Calm down, yeah. calm down, calm down. Yeah. Has the audacity yeah. to come yeah. in front of. Yeah. No, 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 yeah. let me finish. Has the audacity to come in front of me, yeah. making two false claims, the first of which is that the Quran has said. Hijab. Come on. Let me finish. Let yeah, me finish. Man, he, just going at this point. Made, he said it on the camera. He, he said it on the camera. He said it on the camera, and this is at the age of technology. He said ossification doesn't happen at this stage. That's false. That is false. Osteogenesis. He did not say that! Well, we can rewind it. Okay. We can rewind it. Hijab. Excuse me. Ossification does take place by the admission of the authorities, and that's what people are using in the universities all across this country. Number two. No, no. Number two. Excuse Hijab. me. Let me finish. I gave you a reference. Number two. Why when you say that to Mansour? Number two. Number two. You're going on too long, Hijab. Let me talk, though. It's not fair argument. Now, this is why we need to do it time. This is why we need to do it time. Okay, no, no, no. Let me finish this point, and then we'll go. Then, no, then no, you can do it time if you like. But let, I'm just making one more point okay, and then you can say yeah, what you sure, like. Sure. Number two, yeah. is the only interpretation in the Quran that the fa is chronological or the meaning is it chronological? No. There are two interpretations in the Islamic understanding. One of them is that it is chronological and the other one is that it's not chronological. And Ibn Rajab Al Hanbali, he takes the view that all of it happens in the first 40 days. And the, he mentions that in his Sharh of the Hadith of in the Ahadakum Liakuna fi Batni Ummihi Arbaina Yoman Mutra Alaka. Thumma, sorry, not for Thumma Yakuna Alaka Tan Bada Dalika, Thumma Yakuna Mudratan Bada Dalik. And then he says, this, and then it, because you know, excuse me, hold on. No, no, hold on, hold on. This hadith says, and, and wait, 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 let, me finish, let, me finish, let 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 me finish, you need to hear all the data, otherwise you won't know what, listen, let me finish, you're not finishing let me finish, you're not finishing though, give me what, you're not finishing though, let me finish, there's another way of the hadith, listen please, calm down, please, then talk as he said, in the, there's another hadith that's very important. This is very important. So he said that in the hadith of Muslim, and the, listen, the hadith of a Sahih Muslim, it's which means in that time, listen, it means in that time, it will be like that. So because it said the opinion of the Hanabila and the Mata, the Hanbalis, is that it all happens in 40 days. Why is it there for that there's a difference of opinion among the Fuqaha when Wait, you're just making another point. Please, oh, man, yeah, stop. Yeah, yeah. Stop. 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 Stop.
No, 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 Based on the hadith and the interpretation of the hadith of, the, of Ibn Raja al Hanbali and other Hamad Abdullah. Therefore, now to make another in point. Summary, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In summary, 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 number one, the interpretation of in, the interpretation of chronology is not consensus. Number two, even if we say it is, it includes the cart uh, cartilaginous uh, models, and that is what, according to this book, which is an authority that all of the doctors are using is actually happening, ossification and mesogenesis are happening at the same time. And that means to say that the, the cartilaginous models are moving in the way that the Quran says, you have nowhere to go. Okay, so now let me report. Now let me report. Okay, we're, gonna, we're just gonna change the battery. We're gonna, we're gonna, let him go, please. Now I'm gonna give him this time. No one interrupt him. Yeah. <coughs> Tell that to Mansour. <laughs> you told him to come so he should finish film. Please, please, uh, everybody, make sure that you don't interrupt him because whatever he says is going to be refuted and then we're going to move on to the Bible where he's going to have nowhere to run. Okay, so, guys, I listened carefully to the book that he quoted. Okay. And this is why I, I, I didn't want him to go on making point after point after point after point so that we could address all the points. This is how you construct a fake miracle. You blind people with words. It's an, a, a rhetorical device called Sufism. You, it's just sophistry. You bring out lots and lots of things. People can't grasp all the points that you're making. And then because they can't process all the information, they just accept the summary. And this is a tactic that Hijab has just demonstrated perfectly. The, the, act, notice the interruption. Notice the, inter notice the interruption. So, ladies and gentlemen, I listened to the quote from the book that he quoted. And what I heard, what I heard was that bones and flesh grow together. But if you remembered when I asked Hijab to name the stages, he said, and you'll see the flashback on our, on our picture on Soko Films, he said, that bones came before flesh. He did, he did. That's what he said. Yes. So he said yes. the bones came before flesh, and then he quoted a book that said exactly the opposite. <laughs> and he thought that I wouldn't notice. And he thought that I wouldn't notice. But I did notice because I have examined this sophistry before. And I understand its rudimentary tactic. The idea is to blind you with lots of big sounding words. Let me just, let me just clarify. Let me what, let me just clarify. Clarify Bob. In another part of the Quran, so we read 23, um, 23, 12 to 14. But in two, five, in Surah two, uh, Ayah 259, okay. it also Tumma, Tumma. says exactly the same. It's towards the end of the verse. If yeah, you're no, no, no. Tumma, there's two, two khara'is in that one. Yeah. Thumma nushiruha azma and thumma nushiruha uh, azma. Right, yeah. okay, let me, let me give the English. But you won't get what, uh, both khara'is in English. Let, let me give the English, bro. Yeah. So that's why you need I somebody. I am still making knows. my point, Hijab. <laughs> Fine, bro. Hijab, take your I'm time. still making my point. <laughs> take your time, please. Yeah. Okay, so. In Surah it. 2, 259, it reads. Yeah, yeah, please. Because if I get to it. Do you want me to help you out with that? No, no, I can oh, find it, thank you. Oh, it's just a case of. It's, it's not about embryology, you know that. Let me, let, it said, now notice it said it's not about embryology. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, so let's actually look at whether it talks about embryology. Okay, yeah. It says yeah, this. And thus we have made of you a sign for the people. Look at the bones how we bring them together and clothe them with flesh. When this was clearly shown to him, he said, I know that Allah is able to do all things. No, don't interrupt. 
You insisted that I didn't interrupt. I'm going to say everything I've got to say. You've got to listen. So the fact of the matter is, in two places, the Quran says bones, then flesh. Hijab said bones, then flesh, and then quoted a book that said flesh and bones grow together. That's what he did. And he hoped you wouldn't notice. Now, he also talked about ossification. He also talked about ossification. The reality is, unless hijab wants to say that he is an embryologist, it is clear from every work of embryology that bones are not immediately ossified. They begin as cartilage. The Quran does not mention cartilage. He said, have you got a problem with that? When he quoted the lexicon. And I said, yes, I do. But he insisted that he finish all of his many, many points. Are you honestly telling me that Allah doesn't have a word for cartilage when he wants to talk about cartilage? And he doesn't have a word for bones when he wants to talk about bones? No, no, you're going to listen. He's losing his patience now. He wants... Oh, and look at the interruption. So... Tell me when you're finished. Yeah, I'm going to. But I'm going to finish all my points. Like, you mentioned a lot. I've tried... No, 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 don't... Don't interrupt. I'm not interrupting. Stop interrupting. Just stop interrupting. Right. So, the reality is, and I just challenge you to check me now. Do bones, what, what is a bone? A bone is an ossified cartilage. There is a reason why we have distinct words for cartilage and bones. And what you're saying is, Allah is inaccurate in his description. Because he can't use a word for cartilage. He uses one that could mean cartilage and could mean bones. Or could mean the two things together. If he means the two things together, then it's an error. Because cartilage is not bone. If it could be cartilage or could be bone, then it's an error because it should be cartilage, not bone. So either way, the Quran is wrong. Now, he said, he said, hijab, are you impressed at my memory of how I remembered all your arguments? He said, how dare you, a layman in philosophy, a layman in Arabic, a layman in embryology, have the audacity to stand in front of me? Do you all remember him saying that? Do you see, he's not the only one with a good memory. Let's just correct a fact. He came and stood in front of me, not the other way around. But secondly, secondly, he is a layman in embryology. He is a layman on this topic, but I'll tell you someone who isn't a layman in embryology. Here's, a, here's someone who isn't a layman in embryology. So, someone who isn't a layman in embryology Embryology is Dr. P. Said Myers, a human biologist from un the University of Minnesota. Okay. He describes the Quran's understanding of embryology as follows. Vague and fuzzy and basically stealing from Aristotle. says about the Quran. Uh, what does he know about the Quran? Now, why? This is the interesting point. Why does he say the Quran is stealing from Aristotle? Why? Now, personally, I think he's wrong. Doctors at the time who were educated in medicine. But if you listen to Aristotle's words, listen to this. Hey there, Bob. This is quoting from... Um, Quoting Aristotle's work on the parts of animals. Okay. Aristotle lived 350 years before Christ, which makes him a thousand years before Muhammad. I thought it was 337. And this, no, 350. And this is what he says. Stop interrupting. <laughs> In the const, this is embryology according to Aristotle. Listen. Around about the bones and attached to them by the fibrous bonds grow fleshy parts.
for the sake of which the bones exist. Does that sound familiar? Bones, then flesh. That was a common understanding at the time of Muhammad. Yeah, right. There is nothing miraculous about, about what the Quran says, nothing. and the Quran gets it wrong. Right. Thank you right. very much. Now it's my turn to respond. But I do think we should time it, by the way, because uh, we don't know. Oh, now you want it timed. No, I do think so. I agree. Let's yeah. time it. Yeah. What, what do you want? Five minutes. Five minutes each. Can we get a timer, please? Five minutes each. And you've got to be willing to show your phone to both of us on request. Five minutes is better. Are you willing to show your phone to both of us on request? Okay. All right. We, we, now, we just, we before I, but actually, let, 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 let him get it. Yeah, he's been yeah. right. So you said five minutes. Yeah. Five okay. minutes each. We got this. Okay, go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's read it again because I don't think this man has good comprehension skills. <laughs> he said that it, no, he doesn't have good comprehension. This is the problem. We're dealing with someone who can't understand. He said that it said that both of them are forming at the same time. No, it doesn't say that. It says, soon after the cartilaginous models of the bone have been established. So first what we have, cartilaginous models of the bone have been established, yeah? Then it says what? The myogenic cells, which have now become myoblasts, yes, aggregate to form muscle masses. Now let me explain what it's saying here. It's saying that you have cartilage, or these cartilaginous models, and then you have the myoblasts. Or myogenic cells which then become myoblasts that are coming on top is that what it says yeah everybody knows who has done even a little bit of reading in embryology that myoblasts are the cells that are responsible for muscle growth that is a fact of embryology go to any book of embryology that you like it is responsible for flesh so he's saying that it's saying at the same time. No, it's not. It's saying first the cartilaginous models have been established, and then after that, you have the myogenic cells, which are responsible for flesh, that are coating them exactly as the Quran. If you want to take the chronological reading, as I said, though, that's not the only interpretation of the Quran because there's fair attaqibiya, the fair which comes as like summa, which is for chronology, and fair as as, as fair as sababiya, or a fair that's not necessarily like that. For kasaun al aydama, lahma, that we have clothed the bone with uh, muscle. So that's point number one, completely and utterly refuted. He said it said, and this is false. It's, it's, Demonstrably false. He said it said it at the same time. Where is in what I read saying the same time? Can you read and understand? Do you understand that myogenic cells are responsible for flesh? Do you understand that ossification is responsible for bones? But he said ossification continues. Do you know when it continues until? It continues until adulthood, by the way. Correct. Yeah, so it's, what's that got to do with our discussion? He said that no, he could have used the word Hudruf or the word for, specifically for cartilage. That's not necessarily a good description. You know why? Because had there been any bone that started, then that would eliminate. So all the word Adam includes cartilage and bone, whereas the word Hudruf is cut, cartilage only and not bone. So it would exclude the bone, which would be less specific. Point number three, he mentioned, he mentioned now, he mentioned Aristotle. Aristotle said in his treatises that a woman, she has menstruation blood contributes to the embryological process. I want you to find me one verse of the Quran or one hadith of the Prophet where that is in fact copied. Aristotle. Why is he not copying that? Aristotle also said that the baby is formed in its entirety and then it just gets bigger and bigger. That's completely against the Quran and Sunnah. How comes Aristotle did not mention Nutfat and Amshaj? That why both of the uh, what the Prophet Muhammad said, the Prophet Muhammad mentions Laysa al waladu min al ma'i kulli that the boy or the, the child is not from the entire meaning now what is the Quranic picture chapter number 76 verse number 2 Nutf inna khalaqana al insana min nutfatin amshaj in nabatalihi faja'alnahu sami'an basira that we have made the human being from a, a combined mixture of fluids and we have made them hearing and seeing. So wait a minute. It's the Prophet said it's a part of that mixed fluid. All of it, which is, no, it's one cell of the man and one cell of the woman. There's nothing like that in the Bible at all, my friend. You have no chance. There's nothing like that in Aristotle's work at all, my friend. There is nothing like that in Galen's work at all. 
my friend. And there's nothing like that in the Talmud at all, my friend. How did he know this? Where did he get this from? Did he get it from the Bible where it says that human being is made like curdled cheese? Where it says in, in Job chapter 9 verse number 6 that the, uh, the earth is flat and has pillars yeah. and no one, no one in the, no one in the patristic, listen, no one in the patristic period for 300 years, not one I claim now has ever said that the earth is round based on the biblical narrative. Everyone was a flat earthist. John of Chrysostomus, when he done his exegesis of the Bible, and others, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and if you look at origin of Alexandra, he was a spiritualist. And others, Five seconds. All of this shows that the Bible has no way of connecting with today's science Nine. and the Quran does. Give him five minutes. Right. Okay. Ready? So, so, ladies and gentlemen, there was a lot there. Again, the hijab went on to say. Firstly, we need to establish something that even in ancient times, the Greeks knew that the world was round. This is not something new. It is an enlightenment myth that people in the past thought that the world was flat. And I won't take a lecture from Muhammad Hijab about the shape of the earth when the Quran says that the earth is stretched out like a carpet. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, have you ever seen a round carpet? Or are carpets flat when they are stretched out? Flat. So Muhammad has just chucked his Quran under the bus. No. He went on to talk about the fact that the Quran mentions that the child is created from the fluid of the woman and the fluid of the man. This is an error. It is not a fluid. It is an egg. It is a cell. It isn't a fluid. So he has just exposed the Quran for another error because as the Quran says and we'll quote it and we made the nufta, nufta thank you into a clot sorry sorry here we go thereafter we made him the offspring as a nutfa drops of male and female sexual discharge now ladies and gentlemen if I have to tell you that an egg is not a fluid, it is an egg, a cell, then you don't know what a fluid is, and it would appear neither does your God. But firstly, it says a drop of male fluid. A drop of male fluid, gentlemen, contains thousands of sperms. So the Quran is also wrong there, because a drop of sperm what we would consider a drop of sperm has thousands of the cells of sperms within it, if not tens of thousands. But it's only one sperm that creates the, the human embryo. Furthermore, furthermore, this idea of females contributing to females contributing to the genesis of another human being is not unique to the Quran. There were other Greek philosophers who taught embryology who believed exactly the same. Now he said, what about, what about the idea of the woman's blood contributing to the birth of a human embryo? He objected to the idea of the menstruation blood. And obviously he's right to do so. But the Quran says this. Then we made the nutfa into a clot of coagulated blood. A clot of coagulated blood is not what an embryo is ever. A clot of a co coagulated blood is dead blood. It is stopping uh, based upon a cut. It is stopping 
ruptured, it's stopping bleeding. So the Quran is wrong there. So now we've got, in addition to the embryology error, we also have the error that the Quran says the world is flat, like a carpet stretched out. Thank you. And that is also an error. Remember, he condemned the church fathers for being flat earthers, but the Quran is a flat earther. It describes the world as being stretched out like a carpet. Now, he goes on to talk about the fact that the ossification, he quoted his book again, and he's trying to mislead you because that full quote, do you honestly believe that bones grow without any skin or flesh? Where's the photo evidence? There's no such thing. Flesh and bone grow together. Notice the interruption. It grows at the same time. That is the conclusion of embryologists. And we've got two facts now that the Quran gets wrong. A flat earth and embryology. All right. Uh, I want to break a news to everybody. I want to break news to everybody. You know P PZ Myers, the one he quoted as the embryology authority, who said that the earth was inaccurate. Do you remember that one? That, sorry, that the Quran is inaccurate. You remember the one he quoted? He retracted that statement one week ago. And it's on the public record that he retracted that statement one week ago. And he said, in fact, I retract this point. That PZ Myers, the person here. Person, point number one. Point number two is this. He's, the, the main point he was saying is that the book doesn't say that the cartilaginous models come before the myogenic cells form around them. I've quoted it again and there is a chronological, there is a chronological, sequential, step by step, which completely negates what you're saying. Point number three, there is an interpretation which says both are happening at the same time. So all of these things, you have nothing for them. He then talked about the flat earth. Here's what I say, and it is a challenge to the Christian world, not just you, because you are insignificant. You are a challenge to the Christian world. Be quiet, don't interrupt, don't interrupt. There is not one church father in the first 300 years of Christianity that ever looked at even one verse in the Bible and concluded that the earth is round. Whereas there are scholars in the first 300 years of Islam who looked at the Quran itself and deduced from that that the earth is round. Ibn Munada being one of them who Ibn Taymiyyah mentions in Kitab al Arsh. And that is something that is there. Ibn Hazm being another one who quotes chapter 39, verse 5. Chapter 39, verse 5. And listen, this is taqweer, comes from the Arabic word kura, which means ball. Be quiet, my friend. Shut your mouth. Shut your mouth, my man. Calm now, down, having Richard. said this, Calm having down. said this, now. You're getting excited, Rick. Calm is, down. Having, no, I'm, no, it's not finished. Be quiet. Ali, be quiet. Here's what I would say. Look, listen to this. Listen to it. Be quiet. Listen. Now, what have the Jews said about the Bible? They believed in something called metal plate theory. Look what he said. <clears throat> That in the Midrashim, which is the exegesis of the Bible, for how many hundreds of years, no Jew has looked at the Old Testament and concluded around earth. They believed in the thickness of the firmament equal to that of the earth. And he talks about metal plates. And you can, you can even see here that, you can even see here that some of them look at origin of Alexandria. He looked at the Bible, the first page of the Bible, bro. The first, yeah, the first of it, stop laughing. It's the first page of the Bible, the first page of the Bible, which talks about the creation of the heaven and the earth. When the second day, what was created, the luminaries were created before the sun was meant to be created. Origin said, What man of intelligence? Listen, be quiet. What man of intelligence will believe this? This is your church fathers condemning the literal reading. He was forced yeah. to spiritualize the meaning of the Bible because it was contradictory to the reality. Yeah. And he said also, what man of intelligence would, when, when in the Bible, it said that the devil, 
took Jesus to the high mountain and could see all the nations of the earth. That's the New Testament. Yeah. And he said, what, how, could he, how could he see it? Origin is saying this in On Principles, in the, in the appendix section. Yes, yes. He said, what man can see with his own fleshly eyes, all the nations of the earth. Now tell me now, where is your, where is your evidence? I've asked you once, I'll ask you again. Get me one church father. I've given you two references myself just now. Get me just one reference of anybody looking at any verse of the Bible and concluding that the earth is round from the book itself. Not, not because of Aristotelian law to the exegesis or people like Augustine when he, when he started mentioning the, the round rotundity of the earth. That's a different situation, yes. Yeah, yeah, but he didn't look at the Bible and say it was round because of the earth. He, and if you look at John Walton, who is a Christian scholar, he mentions the circle of the earth, which is mentioned in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22. And he said, but that by consensus, this means like a disc. So don't ever come to me with this. I have already told you, Ibn Hazm, Ibn Munada, the Salaf, the people and the Salaf of the first 500 years, saying the earth is round because of the Quran. Not one church father says the earth is round because of the Bible. Respond or be condemned. <laughs> okay, that was brilliant oratory. I think yeah. he deserves a round of applause. Yeah. That was absolutely brilliant. Are we all done? <laughs> by the way, by the way, Allah is not a mouse. He's not a mouse. He's not a mouse. He's not a mouse. Doesn't matter how many times you say he's a mouse, he's not a mouse. Akbar means mouse. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was a brilliant piece of oratory. But unfortunately, complete flannel. And the reason why it was complete flannel, ladies and gentlemen, why? Is because the church fathers were not trying to argue that you should become Christian because of science. This is a modernist style of argument. Notice the interruption. This is a modernist style of, in, of, of argumentation. The early church fathers were trying to convince people to become Christian by using philosophy because that was the lingua franca of education at their time and they were good at it. The reality is in the book of Job, if you want to mine some verse to, to quote the idea of the earth being round, in the book of Job it says, and blessed is he who sits upon the circle of the earth. It's Isaiah, by the way. No, it's in Job. It's Isaiah, by the way. It's in Job, stop interrupting. <laughs> no, furthermore, above. furthermore, above. he said, oh, we've got all these Muslim scholars who believe that the world is round because of the Quran. Why did they even bother? Pythagoras knew the world was round before Jesus. The Greeks knew the world was round before Jesus. It wasn't a new thing. They didn't need a revelation to do it either. But actually, let's listen to what the Quran says about the shape of the earth. It says, have we not made, everyone say made, made. the earth as a bed. <laughs> a bed is a what bed. the Quran says. When was the last time you slept on a circle bed? You sleep on a flat bed, hijab, not a circle bed. So yes, Muslim scholars believed that the world was round, but so did the Greeks a thousand years before them. A thousand years before them says that the world is made like a bed. So, stop interrupting. So, now coming back to this question about ossification and bones. So, ossification and bones. Basically, Mohammed Hijab has admitted a few things. Number one, he has admitted that some Muslims do, and he seems to be one of them, interpret the verses of the Quran as sequential. So I'm not misrepresenting Islamic beliefs. There are Muslims that argue it. 
two, he has admitted that there are alternative words for both cartilage and bones. And I need to remind you that the reason why we call cartilage cartilage and not bone is because they are not the same thing. They are ossification. That went really quick for five minutes. Anyway, fair enough. So in terms of in terms of ossification, Allah could have used the right term. The reality is, biologists will tell you that bones and flesh come from the same material, the mesoderm. Bones and flesh come at the same time from mesoderm. And he didn't like Dr. P. Z. Myers. He said that he retracted it. I'd like to see the reference. I want to see the proof because it's easy to say he retracts it. I want to see the proof. But it's not just Dr. P. Z. Myers that says this. It's also Dr. Joseph Needham who dismisses Quranic descriptions of embryology as a cheap ripoff of classical text. And Dr. Joseph Needham is also an embryologist and he studied the history of embryology. So we have nothing unusual in the Quran, nothing miraculous in the Quran. The Greeks knew it beforehand and also the Quran gets it wrong. And he's talking about patristic fathers. Okay. All right, guys, let me read out. He said it's Job. The circle of the earth is in, in the book of Isaiah as I corrected him and told him. He and look at this. Look at what John Walton, he says this by word. One of the supported texts on this, sorry. He says, uh, 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 he's, so basically here. Are you listening, Bob? One of... Uh, uh, one of the most common examples given by those who suggest that there is a latent scientific consideration is Isaiah 40:22, which posits a spherical earth. This cannot be sustained because its terminology indicates a disc, not a sphere. A disc, not a sphere. Walton, 2009, page 174. And the word used here, hug, hug in, the, in the Hebrew language, does not mean a sphere. Hug in the Hebrew language by the consensus of those who speak, by the consensus of the Midrashim, by the consensus of our Aha and all those individuals, it means a, a, a disc, not a sphere. So tell me now, tell me now. I want to know, the people want to know, he wants to know, even this guy wants to know. One verse in the Bible which can particularly be interpreted in a way to in any way direct, indirect, indicate that the rotundity of the earth rather than the flat disc nature of the earth which was the consensus of the Jewish Midrashim, the consensus of all of those who have ever looked at the Bible and, and had a cosmology because of it. That's the first point. The second point is this, he keeps mentioning the mesoderm. I don't think he understands what the mesoderm is. The mesoderm is the flesh that comes over the, the cartilaginous models. I've already explained this, you can go back to the references. If you don't like it, there's another interpretation which implies simultaneity, that the bone happening at the same time, no problem. There are two interpretations. Number three, I'm not making the argument that all of this is miraculous. I have not said that. I believe that the Quran speaks in a way that everybody can understand. From the physicist to the farmer, from the 7th century dweller to the 21st century man. Does he not know what he created? And he is the all subtle, all aware. He is the all subtle and all aware. Yes, so Allah speaks in a way that the Bible does not speak in. That people from the very early times the Christian scholars themselves were making a mockery of the literal reading of the Bible. Look at Origin of Alexandria again. Wow. Origin said, of it doesn't matter. Don't, don't he says this. How, 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 he talks about this. How, he says, listen, he says, how could it possibly have happened literally? Either that the devil should have been led Jesus up to a high mountain or that his fleshly eyes, he should have shown all the kingdoms. He's saying, how could he see all the kingdoms when all the nations were not at the foot of the mountain? 
that implies flat earth. Yeah. That implies, I'm telling you now, defend your Bible. Stop trying to think you have something on the Quran. Where in the Bible, give me one person that ever existed that said that the earth was round because of the words of the Bible. You said, uh, you said Job and mentions hug. He mentioned the sphere, he mentions the disc of the earth. John Walton, who is a scholar of Christianity, says this cannot be sustained because the word means it is a sphere, it is a disc and not a sphere. Case closed, my friend. Taqweer comes from the word kula, which means a ball and not something which is flat. It's over, my friend. How dare you come and talk to me about science? When in Genesis chapter 5, if you add up all the days together, as have the young age creationists, you will come to the conclusion that the universe is 6,000 years old. 6,000 years old, and wait a minute, how do you know that Genesis chapter 5 has all these lineages from Adam to his son, from his son to his son, 130 years, 150 years. Add it all up like Noel has done and you have 6,000 years. You have the audacity to talk about some, some minor thing when it comes to embryology, when you're Bible bashing friends in America have museums and institutions. Hundreds of millions of pounds are being spent on the idea that the universe is 6,000 years old. How dare you tell us that the universe is 6,000 years old and that all these fossils are a conspiracy and come to me and us as the Muslim community. I talk about science. How do you defend yourself against the fact that you have all these fossils, all these facts? And you have your Bible bashing mental man syndrome individuals that are believing the universe is 6,000 years old. The flat earthers were probably Bible believing flat earthers. This is the reality of the situation. Don't ever come here again and talk about science or anything else because it's over. And for more information, go to kbyh.co.uk and go to my article on the proofs of the So allow me to reply. La ladies and gentlemen, are you ready? Right now you're wasting time. Is it fun? Okay. You don't mind wasting five minutes. Oh, sorry. How you get to it? Split. I don't mind. Just five minutes. What's this? Just five minutes. I believe that. I'll be foul. Okay. So where where is this? Bob, you're wasting time. Right. So, in terms of church fathers who believed that the earth was round he wanted me to show him one stop interrupting stop interrupting stop interrupting so he wanted me to show him one erastothenethes of alexandria 276 to 194 calculated that the circumference of the earth within 50 miles of its present an estimate. Listen, listen, listen. No, ladies and gentlemen, in the book, in the book of Job, in the book of Job, one of the oldest books in the Bible, historians credit the Greeks with being the first to suggest a spherical Earth in the sixth century BC by Pythagoras, who suggested it. However, it was known before him. The round shape of our planet is something that is, was common knowledge all the way from the time of Jesus' time to the present. That is why Christopher Columbus went to the Americas, because they believed that the world was round. Ladies and gentlemen, let's be clear about something. We Christians have never made a claim that the Bible is a scientific textbook free from error. That is not a Christian claim. That is not what the Bible claims. So he's judging something by a false standard. He's timing me, he's timing me. Well, now he is. So, Ladies and gentlemen, time please. It's about so, three minutes. Yeah. Three minutes. So, in terms of in terms of our time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. In terms of our time, ladies and gentlemen. Christians don't teach or believe that the Bible is perfect. That is a Quranic claim about the Quran. So you have to judge the Quran 
by what the Quran says, and the Bible by what the Bible says. So the Bible says it is here to teach you about who God is and how to live. It doesn't claim to be perfect like the Quran. So when the Quran, stop interrupting. Stop interrupting. The Quran says what? So when the Quran, bear with me, stop interrupting. So stop interrupting. So when the Quran, when the Quran describes the earth like put your hand up, you think a round ball. Go on, put your hand up. Yeah, your hand up. Oh, nobody. <laughs> not one of them. Hijab. Not even hijab. <laughs> wow. But the Quran yeah. describes the earth like a bed. So I'm right to say <laughs> that the Quran is in error. Yeah. And if the Quran is in error, yeah. according to the Quran, not me, it's not from God. I need to defend the Bible in biblical terms. One minute left. Not in Quranic terms. Two minutes left. In Quranic terms. No, you took time away last time. In terms of in terms of the Quran, it states facts that are wrong. And I can say according to the Quran that it is false. According to the Bible, we do not make the claims about our Bible that Muslims make about their Quran. So him coming here and saying, don't come here and say this and say that, trying to act like the macho man, as if somehow this is impressive, as if somehow this is impressive, does not escape the errors in the Quran, how much time do I have? One minute twenty. Now I have one minute twenty. So I want to show you. One minute twenty. You took time away last time. You took time away last time. Give him another minute, please. Give him another minute. He spent his time doing No, no, give him another minute, please. Thank you. So in Surah 43:10, as if you were in any doubt about what the Quran said previously. Surah 43.10, it says this, Who made you, who made for you the earth like a bed, and has made for you roads therein in order that you may find your way. Like a bed. Who believes the earth is flat? Put your hand up. The Muslims don't, but the Quran does. describing the shit? No. Ladies and gentlemen, he quoted Oregon. Oregon is not a church father. He lied to you. Oregon is not a church father. He's called an ecclesiastical writer. It's a step down from a church father. So he lied to you when he quoted Oregon. And we Christians don't follow the church fathers in their comments on science. Are you, are you, are you happy with that time? Yes. Is everyone happy with the time? Yes. I'm happy with the time. Let me tell you something. This verse that he keeps bringing up, this this thing about bed. He keeps saying bed, bed, bed. Sorry, the word bed, the word sorry mihada means cradle. So for example, when Mary alayhi salam, Maryam, when she was, uh, when she was talking about Jesus, how uh, he, she mentioned that term, that the mehd, when he was in the mehd de sabiyya, which means what? Cradle. Now really when a woman cradles a baby, she cradles it like that, like in a shaped way like that. That's point number one. Point number two, the shape was not what is intended here. That what was intended in an al-Najal al-Adami hada was the comfort. Was the, and how do we know that? In, Allah says in chapter number 67 of the Quran, هُوَ الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمْ الْأَرْضَ تَمْشُوا فِي مَنَاكِبِهَا وَكُلُوا مِنْ رِزْقِهِ That he is the one who had made your, the earth subservient for you. So walk around its manakib, literally meaning shoulders. What are you going to say that it means? It, it means like the earth is like boxes now. No, it means that the, 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 the mountains are referred to in that sense. Go in these areas. But you don't understand imagery. The point of the matter is this. Before the scientific revolution, there were interpretations of the Quran that indicated the rotundity of the earth. 
that is nowhere to be afforded to us in the Bible. I didn't say any church father. I actually mentioned to him in his uh, in his exegesis against the Manichaeans. Augustine, he mentions the shape of the earth is round. You, you don't need Google for that. I can tell you myself, but he doesn't get it. I know. And you let him speak. Let, but I'm not saying my, my argument, I think you've misunderstood it, was not who no church father believes that the earth is round. I'm saying, no, I said that they used the Bible to indicate that that's what the Bible was saying. John Walton, he mentions in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, the word hug means a disc. It cannot be used. It's the closest thing we have. To indicate the rotundity of the earth, he says we don't have to have, we don't have to have. Oh, he doesn't believe in biblical inerrancy. By the way, he might come from a more Catholic background. I don't know, but definitely a large portion of the Christian community, probably all of those in this part, believe in biblical inerrancy, which is the idea that the Bible is flawless. He is heretic in his belief, according to those. No, he is according to evangelicals who believe in biblical inerrancy. He would be seen as a heretic. He knows that. Now, moreover. Here's the, here's the point. When you first open the Bible, and I say this again, when you, the first thing was prediction. Let me show you how. That you find in a Genesis chapter 1, the luminaries were created on the fourth day. Sorry, the sun was created on the fourth day, but the day and night that were created before that. And what, on commenting on this, origin of Alexandria, who he doesn't like because he's telling the truth. No, I like him. All right, he says this. He says, now what man of intelligence, what man of intelligence will believe that the first, the second, and the third day and evening and morning existed without the sun, the moon, and the stars? And the first day, if we may say, call it that, without even a heaven. I do not think anyone will doubt that these statements are made by scripture in a figurative manner in order that they may, through them, be, mystical truths may be indicated. Yeah. He is saying, therefore, that he has to spiritualize and allegorize the verses of the Bible in order to keep away from the biblical internal contradiction. It's not just an external one, but an internal one. How do we know that? Because vegetation is mentioned as, as happening on the fourth day in Genesis chapter one. But when you look at Genesis chapter number two, verse number six, it said that no plant has sprung up yet. So much so, that even scholars are saying this is a contradiction. How could you have the vegetation on the fourth day in Genesis 1 and then in, 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 in Genesis 2, 6, it says no plant has sprung up yet. So were the plants there or were the plants not there? That's the question. Were day and night there? How can you have day and night without the sun? You're talking nonsense. How dare you come with this to us? How dare you are all clowns. You're coming to us and talking about science. You've got your 6,000 year old university, which he didn't even mention. He didn't even refuse. He can't defend himself. He can't defend himself. He had one bullet in the gun. It, it went astray. Now he's he can't defend himself. He's on. He's beneath me. I'm in the mount. I'm slapping. I'm punching. He knows what I'm talking about. He's an MMA fighter. One day maybe he can challenge me. And so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, uh, no problem. And so on and so forth. And that's it. I say this to you today. And I say to you with all my vigor and all the confidence, he has no answers to the rotundity problem, to the 6,000 year problem, to the internal contradiction problem. And I have all the answers to them. So it's always true that if you give a man like hijab enough rope, he'll hang himself. And that is exactly what he just did. Exactly what he just did. He's this point next. He admitted but in that this north Augustine, side, how can you have a church father, believe that the earth was round. He just spent ages arguing that no church father believed that the earth was round from the Bible, but then admits that Augustine did. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, the reality is, and he quote, notice the interruption, Again, Bible, notice the, the interruption. Pause my time. Pause this time, please. Pause this time. Yeah. Of course. Right. Are you Pause done? This time. Okay. You done? No. Okay. You ready? Ask you from the Bible. Are you ready? Wait, wait, wait. He asked you from the Bible. Are you done? You can't. Just okay. From the Bible. He's right. gonna. He's done. Yeah. When you done? Listen to you. Okay. Ready. Right, go. Ignorant. So Augustine himself and Oregon, whom he quotes, both 
interpret Genesis allegorically. That is the orthodox historical use of Genesis. It's only fundamentalists in the 20th century that shouted and screamed about a literal interpretation of Genesis. This is not how the Christian fathers used Genesis. So he just shot his entire argument dead because he evidenced the fact that the historical use of Genesis is allegorical and non-literal, not literal. So he's attacking the Bible based upon a literal reading when he admits that the church fathers don't do that. And then he says, show me the church fathers that do X, Y, and Z. But glory to God, the Holy Spirit that inspired Genesis was smarter than Oregon and apparently smarter than Hijab. Because the reality is, Hijab, and here's a very brief summary of physics, that a sun is a collapsing gas cloud. Before it meets the point of nuclear fission, of driving atoms together, elements together, to get elements, it gives off light, it gives off radiation. If you were stood there before the sun became a sun and entered into nuclear fission, you would be able to detect its light and you would be able to detect its heat. So actually, given this fact, it is true that there would have been light in the infrared spectrum before there was light from a sun that would have come later. What infrared the spectrum. Please, 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 please. The infrared spectrum. What? Are you honestly telling me, are you so ignorant of physics that you think a sun reaches nuclear fission before it gives off heat? Go back and pick up your GCSE study books. You're laughing at your own ignorance. No, that infra infrared radiation, ladies and gentlemen, would have been the very source of food. I do not believe that Genesis needs to be taken literally. I don't believe that. The church fathers don't believe that. So, he's attacking the Bible based upon a 20th century belief that comes from America, not the historical belief of the church. He's undone his own arguments, but he believes that the Quran is perfect. The Quran describes the earth as a bed. Do you believe the earth is a bed? But more than this, here's another error in the Quran. Another one. Until when he reached the setting place of the sun, he found it setting in a spring of black, muddy water. Put your hand up if you believe that the sun sets in a puddle of mud. Who believes that? Nobody. Not even hijab. So, on one hand, we don't need to square the Bible with science in Christianity. But on the other hand, the Quran is in error, even though it claims not to be. So, you can stand there and do your macho routine and try to be the big man. But intellectually, hijab, you're beaten in your criticism of my faith and the defense of your own. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, listen to this. Listen to this. Sorry, it's added, it's added 53 minutes. So what I'm going to do is like, I'm just going to take off that 53 minutes. Sorry? So it's added 53 just minutes. So I'm just going to take 53 minutes. Yeah. Oh, OK, that's fine. It's still counting. Yeah. All right, no problem. 40 now. He says that, he says that the, he's trying to portray that the typical interpretation of the biblical corpus from an ecclesiastic and patristic perspective, the church fathers, was an allegorized understanding. And there is no further thing away from the truth as understood by R.C. Hansen, a, a known scholar who, who, who wrote books and tracts 
attacking origin of Alexandria on his allegorization and spiritualizing of the text in when actually there was no precedent before that for him and the Alexandrian school people like Philo who was a Jew who also had the same kind of understanding moreover now he mentioned Augustine I said Augustine and very important Augustine came to the conclusion of the rotundity of the earth not because of the Bible but despite it he was an Aristotelian and he came to that conclusion my my uh, challenge to him was to find someone who uses the Bible and exegetes it to have a spherical or rotundity of the earth perspective. Number two. Number three, he says that he tries to imply that Origen, sorry, that Augustine, he had the approach of Origen of Alexandria, which was an anomalous and aberrational approach in the exegetical method of the ecumenical church fathers, when actually the truth of the matter is he actually didn't even know that, uh, that Augustine who is a 5th century scholar, actually named his exegesis on a literal interpretation of the Bible. He had two. He had one called against the Manichaeans and he had one called on the literal interpretation of the Bible. So this guy doesn't even know his own books. I know more than him on his own books. Now listen to this. This is going to be a good night argument. I promise you today he will go to sleep. <laughs> he will go to sleep. I am getting bored. Okay, you will go you to sleep. You are going to go to sleep. Just like I'm sure he has been many times in the ring. I'm going to say this to you once and I'm going to say it to you very clearly. One time, Celsus, who was an apologist, a Greek uh, apologist, he came to Origin of Alexandria and he asked Origin of Alexandria, what do you say? How can you have a God that died on the cross? Yeah. How you responded? Yeah. Do you know how you responded? He's moving off the top. Don't let him. Do you know how you responded? He He's definitely going to sleep. Do you know how he responded? And you can see all these references, by the way. Go kbyh.co.uk and download my PDF on the truth of Islam. You'll find all the references there. He basically allegorized it. He said, "All we cannot say that all of the events relating to the, cruci uh, to the crucifixion are true and literal." Excuse me. Stop. Can you stop? Can you stop talking? Yeah, I know, but I can't. I can't. You're not even listening to what I'm saying. You're not even engaging no, with this point. So, or, listen. Look at me. Look at me. Origin of Alexandria. When he was asked by Celsus, and this is referenced in my article on kbyh.co.uk, he was asked, "What do you say of the crucifixion? What do you say of of Jesus dying on the cross?" He said. It, not be seen as literal. In other words, the same spiritualizing, allegorical understanding that he employed with Genesis, he employed with the crucifixion. So if you want to have your cake, you can't eat it. Because the reality of the situation, if you start saying that Genesis is an allegory, then you might as well say the whole crucifixion was an allegory if you want to use the hermeneutical principles of origin of Alexandria. It's over. You want to allegorize Genesis, go ahead and allegorize the crucifixion just as origin allegorized it, just as he metaphorized it. Why do you want, why do you have it? What's your principle? What's your principle for allegorization? What is your hermeneutical principle? How can you allegorize one and not the other? Why? On what basis? Who gave you the authority to allegorize Genesis and not allegorize what? The crucifixion. Origin of Alexandria, when probed by Celsus, he allegorized the crucifixion. Meaning, your central tenets, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, and so on and so forth. All of that can be allegorized. And if it is allegorized, what remains of Christianity? It's all fallen apart. It's all gone. It becomes a myth, just like Hinduism. It becomes like the Greek uh, mythology. It becomes like anything else. So there you have it. If you want to say it's allegorized, then you must allegorize. You must allegorize uh, the crucifixion because there is no authority that you may be granted. There is no authority that you, hermeneutical authority. Yes, that you may have. Yes, yes. There's no hermeneutical authority that you have to allegorize one and not the other. And that's why it's done. And that's why you're finished. And that is why you can never Stand in front of me. And you can, you can have the rest of the time. Yeah, I'm giving you rest of the time. I'll give you because I gave him an extra 55 minutes, to, uh, 55 seconds. Sorry. Yeah. Right, so, right. Yeah, I've got an extra. Yeah, shall we do this last one?
Okay. So is this, is, am is I speaking last? Yeah, yeah. Is this the last? Am last, I speaking yeah, last? last? No, you go now. No, no, no. Why? No. Tell me why. You started. You're the one no, that started, started. So he, no, no, you, you started, started no, no, because no, you no, laid no. down the parameters of science, so you I go last. No, you started. No, you started. You went, you talked. You forget the question about the hijab. Hijab. You laid out the parameters of science first, remember? You laid out the parameters. You talked about the paradigm. So you started. So I have to finish. So I have to finish. So I have to finish. We started from that. This is the last talk. Fine. Okay. That's wrong. Right. That's wrong. I'm speaking last. This is the last talk. Are we going to get it? Yeah, no, no. Are we ready? 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 Is your last round? And then no, after no, no, no. This is the last talk. Done. After me. After Done. You. Finished. That's where it started. Okay. Are you, you ready? Ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Right, guys, ladies and gentlemen, listen carefully yeah. to the double standards that Hijab is asking you to work to. He is saying to you that you have to believe in a literal interpretation of Genesis. Why? Because of his quote of origin. Now, he didn't actually quote origin, he just threw his name into some statements. The fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, origin is not a church father. So he's quoting the wrong source. Origin is called an ecclesiastical writer. Now, notice that Hijab wanted me to pay attention, but he's not doing it now. So, ladies and gentlemen, we Christians are not committed to a literal interpretation of the Bible in toto. We don't do that. Our church fathers didn't do it. He's admitted as much. He said as much. He said that Augustine believed in a round earth. He said that. So we Christians don't need to defend every statement of the Bible as if it was literally true. Now he said that the description the origin used was literal, that there was allegorical about the crucifixion. I know Origen's writings. I read Origen's writings. And he says that there are layers of interpretation to the scripture that include the literal and go beyond the literal. And he was talking about the metaphorical symbolism that we can pull from the crucifixion. He was not denying the historical event of the crucifixion, Hijab tried to mislead you. No! The Quran has made a number of factually false statements and it doesn't matter with what bombacity Hijab prances around in this little theatre of ours flexing his muscles, kissing his muscles, and trying to talk about beating people up intellectually. The reality is that his Quran has finished his religion. Because his religion, his Quran, says that if it was from any other than Allah, I would find errors therein. I would find contradictions. The Quran says bones became flesh. This contradicts embryology. The Quran says that the earth is flat. This contradicts our study of the world, which is clearly spherical. The Quran states that the sun sets in a puddle of mud. A puddle of mud. And it clearly doesn't set anywhere on earth. I have found errors in the Quran, and the only way that he gets around them is what? Is by saying, oh well, Muslim scholars knew better than their Quran. I agree, but so did the Greeks before Jesus know better than the Quran. He said, well, your church fathers didn't believe in the earth as being round from the Bible. But then he showed that those church fathers do believe in the circle of the earth. Do you honestly believe that they would uphold the idea of the circle of the earth in one hand 
everything. And then, as Christians say that it contradicts the Bible, of course they wouldn't. And why do they not see a contradiction? Because as the church fathers demonstrate consistently, the reading of the Bible is not meant to be a scientific text. It does not have to be read that way, nor does it have to be defended that way. And so his criticism of the Bible is misplaced because it is not what we Christians believe. But he believes that every utterance of the Quran is true. And yet we have demonstrated that there are utterances of the Quran that are false. How many times does the Quran have to be wrong? Time. How many times does the Quran have to be wrong? Okay, I'll finish on this point then. How many times does the Quran have to be wrong before we say it is wrong? Once, twice, three times? You had three examples today. Only one will do. The reality is, bombastic as you are, hijab, loud as you are, hijab, you are intellectually scuppered because you are trying to defend a book that makes indefensible claims about itself. Okay. It's lovely talking to you. As always. No, no, no. We, we said that we were finishing on this talk. That's what. Well, let me do one. I need to do one more. Fair enough. One yeah, more round. One more round. Um, on the muddy pool one, yeah. Yeah. Job chapter one verse four says the same thing. Oh, same exactly. Yeah. Job one for you. Wait, I need to turn it. Time to turn it. Yeah, you turn it over there. Job, you, want to time it. It's up to you. you can both so time it. Joshua, time. Joshua, we'll time it. Time it. He's going to time it. Time He'll time show time. you the five minutes. Yeah, fine. Let him see the five minutes. Oh, I'll hold it here so you can see. All right. Okay, so now, it's very important. Yeah. Fine, fine. We've got it. Okay. It's important to know here the three examples he gave. Number one, the embryology, which we spoke about in detail. We said that there were two readings. One of them implies simultaneity, and the other one doesn't. One of them is chronology. And even on the one that talks about chronology, we talked about with references the fact that including bones or in Arabic language is the cartilaginous uh, models, which are referred to in Arabic as Qudruf, which according to Fayruz Abadi, he mentions that that's included in bones. So there's no issue here. Number two, he talked about the earth as being a mahd, the earth as being a mahd. And we said that that was used in the context of Jesus being a baby boy in the cradle of his mother. It doesn't signify shape, but it talks about function, the function of the earth is facilitated for the human being, it's expansive, it's meant to be from the anthropocentric phenomenological perspective. Number three, we, he then talked about the uh, the, uh, the muddy hatta either uh, when Abdul uh, Qarnain went to the muddy spring. Now he said, he saw it, he, he, uh, he observed it, he found it going into a, 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 a muddy spring. This same terminology is mentioned in, in Surah Al uh, <coughs> Naml, chapter number, uh, no, Surah Al Qasas, chapter number uh, 28, when the hudhud, when the bird says, Inni wajatum ra'a tamlikuhum wa utiat min kullu shayin wa laha arshin azim, ra'aytaha wa qawmaha yasjuduna lil shamsi min dunillah. This is mentioned about when the hudhud, the bird, saw the woman. So it's otherwise talking about from the perspective of the bird. So here again, we're talking about the perspective of the it's, a, it's something which is clear. Number two, number three. So we talked about all three points. He then talked about origin of Alexandria. He was right that he is seen as an ecclesiastic church father, uh, ecclesiastic patristic writer, and the Catholic Church. <coughs> the Catholic, yeah, the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church have not put him as a church father. That's true. That's true. That is true to say. But because of something called the origin crisis that happened after his death, in fact, in the fourth century or the fifth century. So having said that, now. It doesn't matter because he actually agrees with Origen's hermeneutical method. In fact, all of the other church fathers, with almost no exception except for the Alexandrian school, didn't have the approach to Origen of Alexandria and Philo and others had. So, number three, now we have to ask. This is, he said, I didn't reference it, so let me reference it right now. This is what he says. Origen was asked about the crucifixion. He says, the events that have been recorded to have happened to Jesus do not possess the full view of the truth. In, mere, in the mere letter and history for each recorded event is shown to be a symbol of something else by, uh, by those who read the 
uh, scripture more intelligently. This is in uh, against the CC. Chapter 2, verse 69, it's also mentioned K by uk and go to the that I've written on it for all the references. Having said this now, the issue is he's admitted himself that the Bible is not free from error. And the Quran is making the point that you can't say the book is from God if it's not, if it's not free from error. Now you have a decision to make. If you want, if you want to follow a book that is erroneous by the admission of this man, or a book which at least says it's a, it's a necessary, not even a sufficient condition for you to believe in a book which has no errors in order for it to be from God. He doesn't uphold the standard of biblical inerrancy because he knows that's an impossible standard for the book, for the Bible to maintain. And he admits candidly that the Bible is... Or, and I may add, he didn't, he didn't talk about the contradictions, the internal contradictions of the Bible that in origins understanding and other people's that even the Midrashim, they were confused. Why is it that it's mentioned that the, 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 the luminaries were created on the fourth day and that the sun and the moon, sorry, that the ninth right day were created on the first day? Why is it, how could you have, from a scientific perspective, the plantations created on the third day and the sun created on the fourth? What kind of photosynthesis will take place? Now, how can you have plantation on the, thir on the third day on Genesis chapter 1 and in Genesis chapter 2 verse 6 no plant has sprung up yet so here you have contradictions within the text you have contradictions outside the text so contradictory is it that even the ecclesiastic church writers like the origin of Alexandria here admits it and that's why you have to allegorize it but if you do that then you must allegorize other things that he also allegorized in which case you are in a hermeneutical dilemma and it becomes a mythological tale that is no different from Greek uh, myth or Hindu myth or anything else if we start allegorizing one thing with no precedent or at least aberrational precedent then we must allegorize anything we want and that is the situation he finds himself in. Okay, right, let me reply to this because again and again and again oh wait, are you ready? Okay, so again and again and again hijab here creates a false dichotomy he tries to tell you that you have to believe in Genesis literally. The early church fathers don't teach a literal interpretation of Genesis. So we don't need to defend the Bible literally. And so these problems that he's talking about are not there because it's dependent upon how we interpret them. Don't interrupt Can hijab. You who? Don't interrupt uh, hijab. Who doesn't do it? Pause. 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 I want to know. I want to know. Right. Yeah. Don't interrupt. Who, who, who doesn't? Don't yeah. interrupt. Apart from origin. I know we didn't do this to you, hijab. Don't you do this tactic all the time? No, but I want to. Don't you, you do this tactic all the time? It's just a dominating tactic. Control yourself. You're a trained fighter for crying out loud. Not really. He is. Ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? 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 So. The fact of the matter is the church fathers yeah, yeah, yeah. So, is doing this simply to distract. Brother, don't please, please don't engage him. Right. So you right, put ten seconds back onto my tactic. Give him twenty. Stop trying to do this tactic, hijab. It's cheating me. You know it. Right. So we'll try again. So the church fathers don't teach a literal interpretation of Genesis. So he's attacking Genesis based upon the fact, well, how could the sun be there before plants? It contradicts science. When the book of Genesis was revealed, it wasn't revealed as a science lesson to the Hebrew Israelites. It was revealed as a theological lesson to the Hebrew Israelites. It was teaching the Hebrew Israelites that there is no God but one God and he is the God of the stars, the plants, the rivers, the sea, the land, the birds, the things that crawl, and mankind itself. That's what Genesis is really teaching, and that is how the early church fathers interpreted Genesis. No, we Christians, I, he said, I teach that the Bible is in error. No, I don't. I teach that every word of the Bible is true, properly understood. And properly understood is not interpreting every word literally. And that is substantiated by the earliest strata of my writers.
the church fathers and he said it was just origin no it wasn't this is Alexander's augustine well, also did it and augustine wasn't from the alexandrian school he was birthed in carthage so again and again and again, hijab lies and has to be corrected. And he's working on the 99-1 rule, that 99 people will not check what he says except one. No, notice he interrupts again, because this is, yep, you done? Right, so the fact of the Quran says, that the fact the Quran makes these statements that the earth is a bed. Have you seen a spherical bed lately? Stretched out as a carpet. Have you seen a spherical carpet lately? <clears throat> these things are errors in the Quran. No. What will he do? He will argue that these should be interpreted what? Allegorically. Allegorically. That's what he will say, wow. not literally. Because if we interpret the Quran literally, it's false. But if we use allegorical defense in the Bible, he says, oh, you can't do that. You're admitting that it's wrong. No, no, he misquoted origin again. He misquoted origin again. Misquoting means you take part of the text out of the text. I have Origin's books. Origin believes in the actual crucifixion of Jesus. I know he does. I've read it with my own eyes. And I will bring those books and we'll debate whether Origin believes that Jesus was really crucified next week. And I'll show you to be a liar. Okay. Are you up for that? Well, let me answer Good. That. Good. Yeah, go Good. Answer well, that. let me finish. Let me finish. Let me answer that. Let me finish because Origin does believe in a literal crucifixion, but he also believes that the imagery of the crucifixion is so full of symbolism yes. that you can pull meanings beyond yeah. the literal, and that's really what Origin believes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he lied about origin, he lied about the church fathers, <coughs> he lied about our historical interpretation of the Bible, right. he lied about the way that we read of the Bible today, and he also lied to defend his Quran. Ah, Misquoting embryology books to say that bones Time grow on. without Time flesh. Ten seconds. Time. Ten seconds. So origin, um, are you up for that debate next week about whether Origin I, believed I, no, in an no, actual no, crucifixion? I, I, no, I don't say that Origin didn't believe in it. Oh, oh, he's no, changed. No, 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 no he doesn't. Let me say. Let me, no, no, let me, let me, let me. Okay, it's done now, yeah. It's done. Right. So yeah, well done. You you actually do have some knowledge. It's good because when, when we came to Origin, according to uh, Catholic canon, it's definitely I I know that's the case that they didn't put him into uh, they didn't because of the Origin crisis. So that's well done. But you did say to everybody no, no, no. it was a church father. No, I know that wasn't. So if you knew that, no, no. why did you lie no, to me? Let me explain. Let me explain. Yeah, explain to me why you no, lied no, to everybody. Not every Christian is a Catholic. I, well, well, I think you are. I didn't know you were a Catholic. I'm not a Catholic. All right, but I think you lay, maybe lean in that direction. Uh, the point of the matter is the, 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 the precepts you believe in will not be universally believed in by all Christians, and you accept that, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 So, so, for example, today you argued against biblical inerrancy. And you know that that's one of the key stone belief systems of evangelical Christians. Okay, so let me reply to that. Uh, Mohammed, you're going to be really embarrassed now because we have you multiple times on it's camera. Not about say yeah. one second, saying to all the crowd yeah, yeah. that Origin was a church father, and you've just no, admitted no. also on camera that you no, no. knew that he wasn't. No, 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 no. no. So you no, lied no, to no, people. No, no, no. And this is what the Dawa team do. They let's, let's, let's say that he wasn't a church father. He isn't. Fine. He's, he's an not. ecclesiastical writer. Right, right. He's an ecclesiastical writer according to the Catholic understanding. Not I just grant you that. All of them. No, no, no. I understand, I understand that. It's no problem because of the origin crisis. However, what I'll say is this. What I'll say is this. It's irrelevant because what I'm saying is in the patristic period, when we say patristic period here, we're talking about he falls within that, that time. And a lot, of, a lot of Catholic scholars, and by the way, the former Pope, I think Pope Benedict, he believed that he should have been a church father. Many are in, in, in Catholicism are actually saying that origin of Alexandria 
sh should be seen as a, as a church father. I'm really sympathetic to Origin. Yeah, fair enough. I like him. That's what I'm saying. So uh, whether I, that is something that the, the Catholic Church takes or not, that's something else. Origin of Alexandria, in terms of his allegorical understanding, here's my point. The issue that I was trying to say was that it's a hermeneutical principle. Yes. I'm not saying that he didn't or he couldn't read him to uh, to believe in a actual uh, crucifixion or an actual Thank you uh, resurrection. Thank you because you know, uh, R.C. Hansen, when he... I'm not sure, do you know who R.C. Hansen is? No. R.C. Hansen is one of the biggest Christian scholars of the last hundred years. You should know who he is. He, he writes against Origin of Alexandria. Yeah. And what he says is because one of the things that Origin does, he allegorizes the, the story of the four uh, judges. Okay, and that's because of its genocidal nature and so on. Yep, 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 yep. yep. Uh, you know this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what, what I'm saying is, the question that R.C. Hansen, R.P.C. Hansen, his yep. full name, yep. he, he puts forward is that what, what, what hermeneutical principle are you using to allegorize? And that's basically it. It's a bit, ha it's a bit slapdash. We don't know, like, why is he doing this? When, when you said about Augustine, that sometimes he does, I, I sympathize with some of what you said, because what you said is, Although, yes, he, he wrote two, by the way, he wrote two exegeses on Genesis. He wrote one called Against the Manichaeans, yep. and the other one is a literal interpretation of Genesis. And he argues against yeah, the I literal know. interpretation. No, no, he doesn't do either. There's different, look, here's what I will say. He literally I, argues I, against I, the literal I know, I know interpretation what you're, I know what you're referring, I've read, by the way. I know right, what you're, so you know what I'm talking about. I know what you're talking about. He, he doesn't, despite the fact that he, he calls it a literal interpretation, he doesn't, he doesn't have a consistent literal interpretation. I agree with that. Thank you. Yeah, but he's so, but he is contradistinct to someone like Origin of Alexandria. Yes, of course. Yeah, so Origin of Alexandria has completely, in terms of the, the spectrum of allegorization, Origin would fit on the like far right, if you want to call it that. Would you agree with that? Uh, they, 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 there's definitely, there's definitely differences between Augustine and Origin. But the point yeah, is, yeah, that's what I'm saying. right? But the point is, hijab, right? So the, the Alexandrian school, full weight, like in terms of, if, if this is literal and this is um, allegorical. The Alexandrian school are here, and, yeah, and maybe Augustine somewhere in the middle. But, but yeah. the point is, right? What we what we've seen, and the thing is, you've just had, you've admitted it all on camera, is that when the big crowd was around us, you were saying one thing. Now the debate's over. No, you're saying something else. Well, I'm saying no, no, but I'm saying it in front of the big crowd right yeah. here. Look, and it's going wait, wait, on. Wait, it's going I, I, I want to make. I, I, I'm, I'm make doing this for point. academic honesty. Right. Well, right. So right. What, well, wait, if you yeah. want to be academically honest, yeah, yeah. what you shouldn't be saying is that Origin doesn't believe in an actual crucifixion. No, I'm not saying that. Which is what no, no, no. you did say. Okay, fine. Let me let me clarify. Let me clarify. Let me clarify. And he heard. Let me clarify. Let me clarify. What he's because this is a good point. Yeah. Whether Origin believed. I will debate you next week. I don't need to debate. Why so do you actually believe no, no, in no. a literal crucifixion? Like Paul, the question of did Paul believe in an actual resurrection? Of course not. Right, no, no, but you know that there is a discussion about it. Do you know about it? Uh, there, there are discussions amongst heretics, yes. Yeah, all right, fine. <laughs> well, one man's heretic is another man's, one man's, uh, you know, uh, heterodox is another man's orthodox. Imam Bukhari being a perfect example. Yeah, exactly, right? Yeah, Imam Bukhari and Ahmad, all of them. Yeah. He's one man's, uh, he's our orthodox, but he's the, the he heretic. He was considered a deviant in his own time. Exactly that. So but, well, when, we're doing, when we're doing the study of history, we have to try and be objective about these things. So what I'm saying is, on this point of uh, Origin of Alexandria, my point wasn't that he might have uh, rejected the, the, the crucifixion outright as a, a, a literal thing. I'm saying... Like you said, it was, it was still. No, it's all right. It's just, no, it's just no, undone. It's just undone everything. Calm down. Calm down. When he was speaking, when he was speaking, we're, we're, we're actually talking about right. it's, right. it's, right. it's all right. We're talking about it. Don't let him go. Don't let him go. You know he does it. Have some respect. Look, what I'm saying is, what I quoted when Celsus came to him was that when he was, and this is this is my. Let me make it very clear what my postulation is. Because I don't want you to straw man because you have a tendency to that. In this discussion today, I said, find someone who looked at the Bible and then you said, then you forgot about the second uh, point of what I said and you just went with the first one. I want you to understand my argument so you can, but if you want to develop Christian products which are strong and voracious, you have to know my argument first, right? I heard your argument. No, no, but what? So listen carefully to what the argument is. The argument is not that origin of Alexandria allegorizes everything or that he, he might not believe in the resurrection or crucifixion. What I say is, what seems to be apparent from his works, and I talked about on First Principles, the Butterworth um, translation. I have the First Principles. Yeah, uh, Butterworth translation. Look in the back of the book, yeah? Because yeah. there's like an appendix section. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if you look at that, you'll find that his approach seems to be where something is contradictory or seemingly contradictory, he yeah. allegorizes it. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, he done that with Genesis. 
and then he done that again with the crucifixion. Because he, when Celsus came to Origin of Alexandria... He didn't come to him. Oh, what do you mean he didn't come to him? They, they didn't were, sort of come together and have a discussion. No, 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 now you're being a bit ridiculous. Now, when they, when they spoke to each other, like me and you are speaking to each other right now, yeah. right? When they spoke to each other, Celsus is not a Christian, you know that, yeah? Know that, yeah. yeah so when he was, he was doing what I'm doing with you right now, he's debating him. So, Origen was expected to provide an apologetic response. When he did, he allegorized. So what I'm saying is where something seems inconsistent, he allegorizes. That's all I'm saying. And so therefore, from our paradigm, we're saying there shouldn't be any inconsistencies, inconsistencies anyway. And even, here's what, here's what we're saying. Yeah, I know, I know what you're so, saying. So, so let me yeah. reply. Because yeah. what you've just done is admit that my principle is accurate. Because I said that you've got to judge the Quran from within an Islamic paradigm. And you've got to judge the Bible from within a Christian paradigm. And the historical Christian paradigm is not based upon literal prima facie interpretation. That is the historical, continuous use of scripture from the church fathers to the present. Church fathers today are still doing the same thing. One yeah, second. Right. You, you believe that the Quran is inerrant in all of its statements. But you never addressed the flat earth. And when you did address it, you said you said it was from the perspective of the, the, the people. So kind of the same kind of arguments that a flat earth. But that's not the same as allegorization. Right. Same as allegorization. Well, you know that, yeah, yeah, but one second. But one second. But that 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 statement that, that you've made about from the perspective of the birds yeah. isn't coming from the Quran. That is coming from you as an apologist okay. defending what the Quran well, is plainly that's, saying that's, at prima facie level. That's the genetic fallacy, right? Because what you've just what you've just fell into is the genetic fallacy. If, if whether I'm uh, offering an apologetic reply or not is irrelevant. Most of your uh, church fathers are like Justin Marjus. It doesn't mean just yep. because he's doing that that what he's saying is wrong. So like, you're better than that to make these kinds of interrogations. And what I say is, in terms of the perspectival, the anthropological, human phenomenological perspective, that's very clear in the Quran. That that is what is intended. You know that, that there's two recipients of the Quran: the human beings and jinn. So it's clearly it's going to be from the human perspective. It's not going to be from a transcendental, godly perspective that he got, can see every little thing. That's not what it's meant to be. It's meant to be a, a thing. Another thing is this: the point of that origin of Alexandria. What I'm saying is, the hermeneutical principle is problematic because if you say, the question is, here's the question, and I asked this to many people that I'm sure you respect, who are Christian scholars in their own right. I said, what, when, where, can, where do we decide to stop allegorizing, start allegorizing? So, what it, now the hermeneutical principle, where do we decide this is where it starts, this is where it stops? Yeah. What so, I'm saying is, by the way, you said that I said that the, the Quran is allegorizing, I allegorize it. No, I don't allegorize anything in the Quran when it refers to a natural history phenomenon. Okay, so, 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 let, so let me reply to that. You said that I was guilty of a genetic fallacy. Yes. And then you said that Ignatius was an apologist. No, no, no. Uh, Justin, One second. Martin. Justin Martin was an apologist. But Justin Martin was also a bishop. Yeah, okay. Are you a, are you the equivalent of a bishop? Are you like an ulama? No, no, it doesn't matter. Because, because the thing is, you're saying this as an apologist, right? And you're saying this, but, but you're not an ulama. Yeah, but I'm yeah. quoting them. Right, so here's the thing. Here's, Alim. The thing. here's the thing. Alim is a singular. Here's the thing. Is, uh, in, terms of, in terms of the prima facie statements of the Quran, there are many that simply contradict reality. And the only way you can get around that, the That's only way that you can get that around that, yeah, yes, the only way that you can get around that is to make the Quran say things it doesn't say. No, but what which, is, which is what you've no, done. Can I say all the way, wait, 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 all the way through this discussion. So that was the first point. The second point, unfortunately, this guy started screaming in my ear, so I'm not sure I, I remembered what you were saying. Um, oh yeah, where, where does the allegorical start and stop? Right, now that is done within the council of the church fathers. So what you do... Origin is not one. Well, exactly, exactly. So your entire argument was built on someone that no, isn't no, you, even a but, church father. But, Let me finish. It is the, it is, it is the full scope of the teaching of the church fathers. It's kind of like, it's kind of, think of them like a shura, think of them like a council. You compare all their writings together and where they sort of 
focusing on. Are you, are you talking about ecumenical councils? No, 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 no. I'm talking about I'm talking about reading the church fathers as a whole, and where they come to a consensus. This is literal. This is metaphorical. It falls within a spectrum, and it's the church fathers themselves in the reading of them whole that decides for us what is and what isn't. And there'll always be some that fall out of the lines this way and fall out of the lines that way. What, what I'm saying to you is that the Islamic perspective, like for example on the Madis principle, yeah? Yeah. Well, we are, we are not trying... Why I quote uh, classical authorities from the 4th, 5th century is to show you that the understanding of people who are not influenced by modern discourses was not put in. It couldn't have been because it's, we're talking about someone in the fourth century. So, for example, in the, in the case of the round earth, I call him the Munada, right? So, who, who is one of the he is one of the students of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. So, he's we're talking about 250 or something, right? So, he, he's a literalist, if anything. Yeah. He, he will be the equivalent of I don't know, like. I don't know who's a, li a literalist, but maybe... A biblical fundamentalist. Yeah, maybe. Something like that, right? So, he's that. So, when you put it from that perspective, what I'm saying is... So, therefore, he couldn't have... Like, for instance, you know the issue of the earth... Uh, sorry, the sun. There's one Shad reading of Ibn Abbas, who's a, a companion of the Prophet, who, who put on top of the verse of chapter number 36, verse number 40, وَالشَّمْسُ تَجْرِي مُسْتَقَرٍ لَهَا ذَلِكَ تَقْدِرُ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَكِيمِ The sun runs to a course. He reads it, وَالشَّمْسُ تَجْرِي لَا مُسْتَقَرَّ لَهَا And he puts that in the, he's, he's, he's like tafsir, his um, yeah. exegesis. Yeah. The sun runs without a place of setting. Yeah. So he's, he's now in exegeting. Oh, yeah, this yeah. man was, um, was praised by the Prophet himself. He was praised, he was taught. So it's unlikely that he's going to be trying to make the Quran say something it doesn't say. Do you see what I'm saying? You know that there are hadiths where Muhammad repeats the claim that the earth sets in a puddle of mud. Those outside hadiths, of the Quran. Those hadiths are weak. Hassan, not Daif, they're, they're Hassan. No, no, they're, they're weak. No, wait, wait, this, is, this, is, this is the point. This is, this is the, the, I, I, I believe they're Hassan, I've seen them as Hassan. Why is that? Wait, wait, for that, you talk to your Islamic scholars, I, I just see... No, no, no. no, one second, one second. All I see is how Muslim scholars call it. Some Muslim scholars call it Hassan. You're obviously quoting some scholars say that I'll have to get here next week. Yeah, yeah, one second, one second. Yeah, yeah. One second. No, I the, do the, give it to you that there's some that say it's Hassan. Thanks, so I'm not lying. No, you're not. Thank you. No, 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 so, my point is, so my point is, there are hadiths that are Hassan, yeah. right? And just for those of, that, that, that don't know, what is Hassan? So there's the difference between Daif and Hassan. Daif is weak. Yes, I know. Okay. Hassan. Then, then you have another grade which is right above it. It's called Hassan al Ghairi. Which is Hassan because of another another hadith. Yeah. So there may be a two week hadith that make a Hassan al Yeah. And then, but Hassan now is depending on which scholar. Because a Tirmidhi who wrote a Jama'at Tirmidhi. All I'm asking is what is Hassan? It's, Just it's, give us the show. It's referred to as good. Good. It's not authentic. Sahih is authentic. Yeah, I know, I know authentic. Yeah. And then there's a level above Sahih. Yeah. So my point is that there are there are hadiths that are Hassan. I've seen them labeled Hassan on yeah, yeah, Islamic okay, websites. Exactly. Right? I'm not in the I'm not in the habit of lying about these things. Because I, I know you'll get blown up if you do. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta be clear about stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we've got is hadiths that are considered Hassan by some scholars, yeah. and that takes us into a whole other problem about hadiths, yeah. where Muhammad repeats the claim that the sun sets in a puddle of mud, and that is outside of the Quran. So it's clear that there is evidence that early Muslims believe that their prophet believed that the sun set in a no, puddle. No, but the thing is, if that was true. We should see that the early exegetes, like a Tabari, Ibn, uh, Ibn Kathir is not that early, but he's like somewhere in the eighth century or uh, AH. And those literalists, they should have taken that view because they didn't really care about science. For instance, a Qurtubi, who is an Andalusian scholar, he argues he argues the earth is flat because of uh, he, he uses the Quran to argue the earth is flat. Okay. Right. So he says that it's, for example, Medal Ard. Not what he didn't use what he used by the way. He didn't use the, the Mahd. That's not, he used yeah, I've got, I've got the ones. I've got to find the ones with the carpet. I no, no, find the, the carpet one is not a good one to use because it's not the one that the, the Islamic scholars use. Well, well, look, all right. I'll, I'll tell you which one. Yeah, tell me the best one, and I'll come back and uh, I'll right, use no, that. The thing is, I, what I'm saying is, no, no, no. I'm curious now. What, go on, uh, tell he, us the he best uses one. uses chapter 13, verse two. Chapter 13, verse yeah, two. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He, he, he doesn't use Mahd. Right. Mahd is as a weak. What you were saying was kind of weak. Yeah, go on. Al-Qurtubi mentions Madd al Ard. He stretched the earth. Yeah. He says stretch that, that indicates the flat the, the flatness of it. Right. Right. So what I'm saying is that these scholars they didn't care about scientific like what right, let's say we're I'm listening. He yeah. wasn't he didn't give a damn like that. So El Qurtubi would mention this kind of thing. You got it, yeah? I'm Use looking that. for it. Yeah. So what I'm saying is 
Where the, on the literal interpretation, there are two interpretations. There's one which says it's round and one that says it's flat. So we agree that, they're not, that, that there are scholars that don't use literal interpretation. Say again. So there are scholars in Islam that are not using literal interpretation. On naturalistic phenomena? Yeah. No. There are only there are No, there isn't. So all, all Muslim uh, scholars so are so using let me tell you, literal. Right? Well, on the naturalistic stuff? Yeah. Practically all of them. Okay. So, so we we'll, we'll talk about the Ashari school, yeah. the Asari school, yeah. and the Maturidi school, and the Mu'tazili school. Yeah. So even someone like a Zamakhshari, who was a Mu'tazilite, he would he would see all of those things as literal. Yeah. The only ones who didn't were the philosopher, the philosopher. Yeah. The, the philosophers. Yeah. But they were they were not they're not. Like Ghazali. No, Ghazali was Ashari. Okay, fair enough. A philosopher like Ibn Sina Avicenna, yeah. and Farabi al Kindi. Yeah. They didn't, so for example, if they are al Kindi and Avicenna, they didn't believe in a, 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 even the day of judgment was going to be physical. So, I mean, uh, this is this is fascinating, right? I, I, you know, one day, Hijab, it would be nice for me and you to sit down in a place without the crowds. Yes, yes. You know, and, and to have a proper conversation. Because I, I, I much prefer this than the shouting yes. matches, to be honest. I do. You know, I, I can do, as you know, I can do shouting matches all day. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, right? But, but ultimately, it just becomes too confrontational. This kind of discourse is good. What, what, I'm going to leave you because I, I I've do got one go. question for you, though. Yeah. I, 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 let I, I, me make one point. A curious, one a curious point. Let, one, yeah. what, let me make yeah. one point. But what you're going to see is, in the course of our calm conversation, you undid your arguments against the Christian faith. Well, people will make their own judgment. Yeah, of course. But I, I think that in the course of our calm conversation, yeah, yeah. you actually undermined all the arguments you made. To I, the I don't think so. Yeah. I think I just clarified what I thought was straw man. Yeah. But let me tell you something, right? Okay. What was your question? My question was this. You know, you you stated that the you stated that the um, the church fathers. Yeah. Um, um, tell me if you didn't state it like this. No problem. But you stated that the church fathers. Okay. That they had this allegorized understanding of, of for example, they didn't expect. Gen they didn't exegete uh, Genesis in a literal way. Yeah. So who are you referring to in particular? Um, Augustine. He, he would be a perfect example. He actually draws out all of the, if you take it literally, all of the obvious prima facie contradictions. In what book are we talking about? Uh, I'll have to look it up. Because there's two that I've read. I'll tell you what I've read. Okay, let yeah. me explain. There's two. I've read Against the Manichaeans and I've read A Literal Interpretation. By the way, A Literal Interpretation is going to be hard for you to access. It's not easy. You can't get it off PDF. Yeah. I had to I had to go around to get that book. Yeah. I actually had to go around to get that book. And so, I read it. But here's my here's my conclusion. Uh, so just let me give you I don't think he, I don't think he does actually allegorize it. Augustine Augustine all, all the church fathers use allegory. It's I, the I most, know but it is the most is oh, one second. Account. Allegory is the most consistent use of scripture in the church fathers. I, oh, fine, but what I'm saying is we're talking about for example Genesis narrative, right? Yeah. No, Even you said all, of, all of the Old Testament, they do it throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. Yeah, no, but what I'm saying and is, in the New Testament. But Augustine, when I read his books, when I read the, his exegesis on it, he doesn't seem to allegorize it at all. There's no indication of that. In my reading of Augustine, he definitely, yeah, in fact, in fact, he definitely, he definitely he refused, argues. He refused to Alexander. In, 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 yeah, 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 he does because he thinks he goes the, they, too, they think they go too far. Yes, but he definitely argues against the idea. Can I tell you what of, he says? Uh, he definitely argues against the idea of reading Genesis chapter one and chapter two literally. He he, he, he basically points out if you say? read it literally, they contradict one another, and no, that's that, the argument that you were making. Yes, I know. So you were insisting upon a reading that is alien to Christianity. No, 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 but uh, Augustine d does say that, he problematizes it, but he doesn't say, therefore, we should allegorize it. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll have to look it up and see yeah, exactly no, sure, what sure. he says. But what I'm saying is... But he doesn't argue for okay, a literal... Okay, let, let me, let me, can I just tell you what I read and tell me what you think, yeah? So I read John of Chrysostomus, yeah? Is that how you pronounce his name? Chrysostom. Chrysostom, yeah? He had a, 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 um, an exegesis of Genesis. Origin had an exegesis of Genesis. Augustine had an exegesis. Of, not all of them had it. Yeah. The one Origin had was more homiletic. Yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't intended to be like it, uh, Augustine was not trying to. It's not homily. He was trying to be uh, scrupulous and scholarly, right? Yeah. And he's two different things. So these are the three main ones I've read. I, I know other ones have other church fathers have commented on it, but haven't written. Or, or spoken homiletic, uh, for example, preaching uh, the Genesis narrative. From that, what I saw was that Origen seemed to be an outcast, really, from that perspective. So what I'm saying is, here's why I, I don't think it's actually a point 
where using him is a problem. I said, because if you use him, okay, what I'm saying is you said he's not normative, right? From your understanding. Yeah, he's not. He's an ecclesiastical writer. That's right, why he's he, not. A I know he's, he's an ecclesiastical writer. They haven't put him in as a, because yeah. of the origin crisis, right? You know what the origin crisis is? Yeah, it came in the fifth century. Yes, yes, yes. So what I'm saying is, is. Um, and I think it was harsh and unfair. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most people do. Most yeah. scholars that I've read, and, and yeah. that's why I'm of course, surprised with you kind of like degrading him a little bit. What I'm, he, was, he seemed to be a very intelligent man, to be honest with you. He was. And he seemed to be a man of truth. Do you know he what was I was committed to? I, I, wait, one second, because yeah, yeah. one you, thing you, I read from him, that, do you know what? Let me wait, I'm going to try and help yeah. you be a better apologist. Because we'll you quote it. Origin. Well, I think we're both shopping ourselves. You know? Yeah, you, you, are, you quote Origin a lot, right? And the thing is, there's no doubt that in terms of church history, he was the first Christian writer of great scope. Yeah, I mean, the it, most. He, he, most he, voluminous. Yeah, yeah, he was exactly voluminous. He 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 was. His mind was willing to touch everything. But the thing is, just because he was the first in great scope, doesn't mean that he was the sharpest or the best. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah, yeah. And and the thing is, origin. I like. I. I. I if you look at first principles that's right. and study it carefully, Have you that. can actually spot where he goes off the rails in his thinking. Yeah, I know. You can, you can trace out... Well, he talks out, about the, the like, sun and the moon being, uh, is it animate or inanimate? Oh, bro, bro, yeah, the, 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 it's even, I think it's even a bit before that. But the thing is, is as you trace out his thinking, you can see it. Orthodoxy, 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 orthodoxy. Yeah. Oh, crap. And then he just goes off the rails because he makes one logical mistake. And it's about the material, it's about the attributes but, you know, of God, why I which think is inside Islam. Reading him, I've, re I've read him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, let me make one point. It was sorry. the idea about the let eternal me, creator, me, which is something you have in Islam. You, and an eternal creator means an eternal creation. But let me say one more thing. Eternal material. Do you know one thing you said that I read that actually made me really like him? Something, God, this would be great. Honestly, do you know what he said? He, he was talking about, and this is a, in his book, First Principles, I read the whole thing. Yeah. And to the, to the back of it, he was talking about these things that I was talking to you about in Butterworth's translation, and he said, um, We need to, this is what he said, and I was so taken aback by it. And I changed my mind on all the church fathers after I read that statement. I know I what you like as a salesman, hijab, so no, let's no, no. cut the he, he sales. Said, no, he, he, said, he said this, come to the point. he goes, We need to look at the words of the Bible carefully yeah. to discern which of it is from God and which of it is from man. Yeah. And I thought, this guy's sincere. And, and this is one of the reasons why he would be considered an ecclesiastical writer as opposed to a church father. Because the orthodox Christian position is every part of the Bible is the word of God and every part of the Bible is the word of man. That is exactly what we believe about the Bible. That it's God's don't believe in spirit. Inheritance. God's spirit. No, you, you see, you don't. You've got to listen to me. I'm listening. Yeah. So the, the Holy Spirit has inspired every word that man has written in the Bible. But even All the mistakes. Of it. Now, in terms of the inerrancy, right? Because you didn't listen when I said it in the debate. So I'll say it to you now. I believe that every part of the Bible is true. Did you hear that? Every part of the Bible is true, properly <laughs> understood. Which means that those parts that are not meant to be read literally, you don't read them literally. Those parts that are meant to be read literally, you do read them literally. And even on the literal bits, let's just be clear, like, even on the literal bits, when you consider the fact that the Bible is a written account of people's behavior, it's not going to be as, say, perfect as a camera movie of the same events. It will always miss out details. There'll always be room to fit something else in. So when I invite you to the Christian faith, and I do invite you to the Christian faith. Well, that's the first time you said that. No, I'm inviting you. Oh, you're attacking us all the time. So, so I'm inviting you to the Christian faith. I'm not, I'm not inviting you to believe something like Islam. I'm, be, I'm inviting you to believe something better than Islam. I understand what you're saying, but let me tell you something. Right? You know you said truth. Uh, in philosophy, there's different um, definitions of truth. Yeah. So there's, for example, the consistency, um, coherentism. Yeah. There's correspondence theory, which just seems to be the most like popular understanding. And then you have like pragmatism and yeah. different types of. Now, what you, what from what I understood, from what you've said, yeah, is that the truth of the Bible is not necessarily from a correspondence theory perspective. In the sense that. When, when we say correspondence theory, Bert, Bertrand Russell mentions in his book a uh, problem with philosophy, and others have agreed with him, and this is, this is probably the most popular theory, that, say for example, 
Uh, truth is that which corresponds with objective reality. Yeah. Okay. Whereas coherentism, it, is, it doesn't have to be correspondent with objective reality, so long as it's internally consistent. So it's coherent. Yeah. Here's my only issue with it. You know, with the with the with the um, philosophical understandings of truth, whether we're talking about pragmatism or coherentism or correspondence theory, it would seem like the Bible doesn't fit into any of them. Let me tell you why. Because let's say it's not correspondence, yeah. So I accept. We don't accept truth as correspondence for the sake of argument. It has to be read on its terms. I understand what you're saying. We are saying it has to be correspondence. We do believe in that, right? And you're basically saying that you can't apply that standard on us. And I say, okay, fine, accept it. Let's take a coherentism understanding that so long as it's internally coherent. The problem is, what is there? What use is there of metaphors which contradict each other? Like, for example, if you have if you have a metaphor, like if I speak about the difference between validity and soundness of an argument, is that validity could talk about something which is coherent but not actually in uh, objective reality so if I say for example a unicorn uh, done XYZ that's a coherent story if I say a tall short man or a black and white uh, sorry a black and white at the same time or a tall short man or a squared circle that's that goes against every definition of truth what I'm saying is for example in the Bible in Genesis when I'm it talks, might surprise you that I do understand what you're saying yeah so in, 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 in Genesis when it talks about for example that the plants were made on the third day and on in chapter 2 it says uh, no plant has sprung up yet if even if we take this as allegorical the issue is it's not coherent so even if we wanted to take a different understanding of truth it still fails so, that. so let me reply because yeah. you, you, you've actually raised what is a very good question which, to be fair, oh, to, like be fair to be fair, yeah. is the first time I think I've ever heard you raise a good question, which is what is the point of metaphors that contradict one another? Yes. This is something yeah. that is widely discussed in Christian spirituality, because Christian theologians are obviously aware that there are metaphors, even in Jesus' parables, that are in contradiction. The idea of being a slave, the idea of being a son. How can you be the son and the slave of your father? That's a contradictionary metaphor. And, and Christians understand the idea of contradictory metaphor in terms of praxis. The idea is that you are meant to live in the middle of these two contradictory metaphors, not embracing one to the neglect of the other, not embracing 50 from one and 50 from other to make 100, but embracing both 100% simultaneously. So the idea of using the son and the slave idea. God is my father. I see myself as adopted into the family of God. But God is also a king. He also rules and owns me. He created me. And so I must act as a son and as a subject at exactly and identically the same time. That's a good answer. Right. Let me tell you why it's a good answer, right? It's a good answer if, if I would accept that if you said that all the biblical uh, kind of direction to the end user was what to do with their own life. You made multiple points. Let me reply. Let me, no, no, just let me get to this point. Let me tell you something. Man. No, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. No, I wanna, please, please, before no, it comes to my head, man. Hijab, so hijab, 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 hijab. Oh, don't. No, right, you, you all, I, I also want to point out to you something. That the purpose of the Bible in the Christian faith right. is very different from the purpose of the Quran in the Islamic faith. The purpose of the Quran is that it is the nascent proto-genesis of Sharia. It is the basis, the framework, the scaffolding upon which the Hadith put the layers. That is that. Am I yeah, being unfair? Yeah, no, fine. no, that's fair, isn't it? Yeah. Right, but the point of the Bible... But that's it, not the only point. Right? The, the, the point of the Bible is that it is the means by which we understand God and ourselves in the world, the narrative by which we live our lives. Right, I understand. But here's, here's the issue, right? So we have two types of injunctions, let's say, or types of sentences in the Quran, for the sake of, or in any speech. We have sentences which are either commands to people telling them what to do, right? And you have what you call khabar or narratives. Now, I understand if you, even if what you said is a little bit far-fetched, that praxis and you have to live between the two metaphors, I accept for the sake of argument. The issue here is when it comes to statements about history, okay, when we're talking about narrative, yep. the, the, when, the, the truth of the matter is every logician on the face of the earth will tell you that two contradictory things is a meaningless statement. It doesn't exist. It's not real. It's, it's, it's worse than myth. There's no, um, there's no nature in which, or there's no world, possible world, in which what you're saying makes sense. No, you, you, you're misunderstanding. So, 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 just on this point, right? You're, so, you're misunderstanding. The, the idea, if God is telling me that, uh, if God is telling me that the plants were created on the third day, 
and on in Genesis 1 12 whatever it was and then on, in, uh, in Genesis 2 5 he's saying no plant has sprung up here he's not telling us to be anything here so it, it, you said it's, pra it's you, well, hold on. he's not telling us to be anything here he's not telling us to be between two practices or nothing <laughs> he's just saying two things which contradict each other which for all intents and purposes really you can say it's a meaningless Okay, let me, let me, let me reply to that because I understand what you're saying. But you're wrong. You're so wrong, Bijan. The point of Genesis, think about what who Genesis was revealed to. It was revealed to the free slaves of Egypt. And what what were they born into? Those slaves, those ignorant, barbarized slaves. Right, so it's meant when to be finish, about, let me finish. They were born into a polytheistic society in which there was a god for the water and a god for the sun and a god for the land and a god for the plants and a god for these animals and a god for that animals. So Genesis is telling them something. It's telling them that there is only one god and only one creator. And he is the creator of everything that is created. These Bronze Age barbarized slaves were not looking for a science lesson. Yeah, they were that. looking for a theological lesson. Yeah, One back. second. Right. And they get that in Genesis. You are repeating the same error that you made in our debate. You are assuming that because we live in a scientific world, no. that people back in the Bronze Age yeah. were also thinking scientifically. They were not. Okay. And okay. so a scientific... So? One second. A scientific criticism of Genesis is invalid okay. because it wasn't written scientifically for a scientific okay. people. I grant you that. Here's what I said. Thank you. No, no, no. I grant you. Let's go with that for the sake of argument. That, that it's not as a scientific thing, right? So a scientific criticism is invalid. No, no I don't think it is invalid. But I'm, what I'm saying is, let's take for the sake of argument that you can interpret uh, the, the Bible in a way which is non-scientific. Allegorical. You definitely can. Allegorical. You definitely can. Yeah, I, fine, no problem. Yeah, what I'm saying is this. Even on that, or even on that basis, okay, if you do that, if you look at Genesis 1.12, yep. where it says that the plants had been made on the third day, and look at Genesis 2.5, yes. where it said no plant has sprung up yet, yep. here, this particular specificity, I'm not talking about the entire, what the, the motif or the theme of Genesis, this is contradictory. So I am left to assume that it's false. Now, even on a coherentist understanding of truth, not a correspondence understanding, I'm not saying it has to correspond with objective reality. I'm saying even on the coherentist understanding, <coughs> there's no need for that to be the case. Now what I'm saying is this, the Quran is it, not saying, when it says, if this was from other than God, they would have found in it many contradictions. What it's saying is that, it's the principle of sufficient and necessary conditions. Now, the truth of the matter is, in our logical day-to-day -day life, we, we require a certain level of, there's an evidentiary bar that is required in order for us to come to a conclusion about things. If that evidentiary bar is not met, then we can't, we can't believe in those things. How can I be punished for disbelieving in contradictory statements? So let me, let me address that point, let me address that point. Because once again, you've demonstrated what all your Dawa mates do. Ali Dawa, Shamsi, I know he's not your mate, I know he's not your mate. Hashim, Mansour, you all make this cartoonish characterization of Christianity and then you attack it. If you had actually taken the time to read Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, you would see that what they are communicating is different. No, I have. Genesis 1 is talking about the creation of the world and everything in it. Genesis 2 is talking about man's place in the world. So it's talking about the creation from the theological perspective of the importance of mankind. So the chronology is not actually important because the teaching theologically is different. Why is it One second, let, let me finish. Second, let me finish. 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 You should also know that there's plenty of Christians that do harmonizations between these things. You should know that. I know that. So, so the but fact, most of them don't. So the, because most of them recognize that literary, from a literary point of view, you don't need to because it's buying into a modernist myth, which is this idea that we should judge ancient literature by a um, scientific... So is it issue one second, is it issue one second, one second, by a scientific paradigm of today, Not and that is a historical. Now, let's come back to the Quran. Because the Quran... No, but you didn't answer what I but, said. But the Quran... No, sorry, no, no, you just, you get there. no, 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 the yeah, Quran... No.
Iran, as we've demonstrated in our discussion, make statements that are factually false. They do not correspond to reality. No, but that's what you're saying. What I'm saying is that, look, can I, can I just come, come back on this, yeah? We have to understand, okay? You're, you keep saying this. If you want to be a serious apologist, that's more than just like a propagandist. You need to kind of listen to what I'm saying a little bit. Everyone knows that, I've just told you this, the literal interpretation of the Quran is understood by the language, what the language can facilitate. Yeah. For example, you mentioned the alaqa, yeah? Alaqa has three meanings in the Arabic language. In fact, the word is used in other places in the Quran. That's the one about the leech and the... Yeah, yeah the cl clinging and stuff. Yeah, the clinging. Well, yeah. You know, it's mentioned, uh, when it talks about when you have more than one wife, don't leave, don't go to one and leave the other one hanging, suspended. Now that, that would be metaphorical, wouldn't it? Of course it is. Yeah. You know, I believe in metaphor in the Quran, right? And we're not saying we don't believe in metaphoric language. What we're saying is, when you metaphorize things which are not intended to be metaphorized, that's where the problems come. Here's what I'm saying is, going back to the metaphors that contradict each other. So are you happy to say that it's etiology, it's um, myth, that Genesis is myth? I, I am happy to say that a literal reading of Genesis is not what is meant to be right, understood. Right, so is it, is it myth? Yeah, if we, so long as we don't do a false equivalence that myth means false. No, I'm not saying that. Because I believe that the mythology of Genesis yes, okay. is completely true. I know that, I know. I, I, I believe every word of Genesis. I know that, yeah, you're saying that? So you believe that Genesis is a myth, but you, you, you're depending on some kind of coherent understanding of truth. What I'm saying is, the problem is even this, even a myth which contradicts itself yeah. is useless. No. It's meaningless. Yeah, because you're asserting a contradiction based on a prima facie literal reading. And I keep telling you that the prima facie literal reading is not how you're supposed to read ah, Genesis. Ah. So, okay, you know when it says no Quran has sprung up yet? Yeah. What does that mean? So, it's talking, well, let's look at that entire chapter. Because bad dawah is taking verses out of their context, fine, fine, fine. right? So the Genesis story in chapter two is talking ultimately about the creation of man and the importance of man to creation. That man is the priest of God in creation. That he's meant to be God's representative on earth in creation to care and to cultivate. That's the story of well, Genesis two. Well, I would say to you though. So, so can the I, can point, I is, the point you, is, you, you mentioned modernism, right? The, 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 can, can I just say one, 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 second, one, John, second. one second? One second. One second. One second. One second. But the, the the reality is, the reality is, if you assert that the the Quran, when it, for instance, talks about the 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 the, the, the idea of the the, the blood clot. Yeah? yeah, but I'm saying blood is not the only thing. Right, but the point is, that's factually false. What are you saying? Well, I'm, I'm saying, saying that, that an embryo is not a blood clot. No, no, are, you, are you arguing that no, an embryo no, is let, a blood clot? Let me, let me tell you what I said, right? The word is alaqa. Yes. What does alaqa mean? It's been translated as blood clot. Uh, it can be translated as blood clot, but there's three translations. It literally translates I know, it in this Quran. I, bro, you have to, you have to listen to what I'm saying. I've I done a whole listening. series on this, right? I am you can, listening. You can check it on Sapiens Institute. What I'm saying is this, is that one of the words I've just told you, it means to suspend. And I just gave you an example in the Quran. That, وَلَا تَذَرُوهَا كَالْمُعَلَّقَ وَلَا تَمِيلُوا كُلَّ الْمَيْلِ فَتَذَرُوهَا كَالْمُعَلَّقَ So if you have two wives, three or four, don't go to one and then just leave the other one like that so you leave her suspended. So are you saying, so it's so no you're blood saying that involved. this is metaphor? What? No, it's not metaphor. No. So it's not metaphor. No, no, no. You, you, so when you're it says, not understanding what I'm so saying. When it says, so let when it says, carry on, let him carry on. He said three then points. we made the nutfah into a clot. Okay, good. Is that accurate or inaccurate? Yes, yeah, it's accurate. That's so you clot. actually believe yeah, it's, it's that an clot, embryo yeah. is a blood clot? No, hold, hold on, hold on. Cogulated blood, Let that's what you believe. Yeah. Just on you're going on to another point. What I'm saying is that you're, you're saying it's bad dawah. You, you've already referred to the Genesis account as a myth. I'm explaining to you... You say that like it's a bad thing. No, it's not a bad ever. thing. You, you... All right, let's finish okay, now. We're yeah? finished. Right. What you I'm saying yeah. is, even if you understand it, yeah? Oh, careful, careful, careful. It's gonna break, man. Bro, man, be careful, that's gonna fall and break. Yeah. There's a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad yep. where he said, uh, He said that uh, there are two things, two bloods which are prohibited. Two bloods. Yep. He said, and uh, uh, the spleen and the uh, lung, uh, and the uh, liver. Yeah. yeah. 
Now, in, in Arabic language, we have to understand this because if you don't get this, you will you will not improve your your apologetics. It, that's it. You are, you are, you may get the low laying people, but you're not going to get the high level. I, I'm, so happy, let, I'm happy. to let listen, other people touch. Listen. The Prophet referred to the spleen and the, uh, the liver as two bloods. Okay, even though there's not blood there, they're not blood. It's not blood. So what it is is that the Arab custom is that you describe something by how it looks. Do you understand this? I'm hearing you. And this is an evidence because that the Prophet said two bloods and it wasn't actually blood, actual blood. It was uh, the liver and the spleen. So when the Quran states it's alaqa, even the, the, the translation which says blood clot, it doesn't mean by composition, it means by aesthetic value. Do you understand this? I hear that. Okay, good. Now, uh, that's what I'm saying. There's three uh, uh, primary meanings. One of them means that, one of them means alaqa, something which cl clings. Another thing means something which uh, it, it is like a clock. Yeah. But, but let, let, me, let me reply to this. And then but it's we, aesthetic we, rather gonna, than... We're going to have to stop. Because if you get any more microphones on you, no matter how strong you are, you're just going to fall over and that'll be falling into me. So, so, so the point is, the translation that we have from Muslim scholars in Saudi Arabia, they have chosen clot. <laughs> They have chosen clot. I'm not Shamsi. They have, they have chosen clot, right? They have chosen clot. And that is scientifically inaccurate. Fact. Fine. Now, my, my friend is a translator of the Quran. One Two second. of them. One second. One second. Uh, you know, right, one second. Are you wanting to listen? Are you wanting to listen? <laughs> you so the reality is, Hijab. The reality is, Hijab. The, the, when you, when all you did is just make your prophet look worse. Because you, you said that your prophet described things as blood that are not blood. That's in the Arab hadith. Thing. So, so my point to you is, this is just more evidence no, that your no, prophet yeah. was not guided no, 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 by but, God. But, but, thanks, right, but that's but, not that's not what the bro, evidence is. And we're gonna stop. Right. All right. <laughs> it's lovely to talk to you. Listen. Just to show how much I appreciated a calm conversation. If you read it or not, is entirely up to you. But I, I, I want to give you a vote. Yeah. Like not two pence pamphlets. That's an actual. Have, I know. I know yeah. this. I know this author. Have a have a read of that. That's and, my gift to you. I appreciate you, you taking the time to talk to me. Since you gave me a gift. Yeah. Oh, I've seen. Now let me give yeah, you a yeah. gift. I will definitely take a khaki. No, 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 I'll, I'll give you a gift as well. This is a pen. It's a it's a pen I like. <laughs> Fair enough, thank you very much. I accept it with gratitude. It looks pricey, I can't All right, That looks like 50 pound pen. <laughs> Alright, you look after yourself. Nice talking Take to you. Take care, man. Take care. Well done, well done.